It's probably not, Gino, but great way to start the show. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today's show is going to be something else. We have all kinds of stuff going on. We have uh, BBC's Kate Russell here to talk about her new book. Uh, Gino is visiting us. Thomas Hawk is here. Uh, Google's newest acquisition, Brian Matias, is here. He's going to talk about what's happening with the photos community. Uh, we have Ollie Dale, who has this new documentary called uh, Virtually Famous that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, Don, how do you say your last name? Kukaracha, Don? Close enough. Uh, Kamarachka. But Close. either works. <laughs> he has these amazing uh, uh, snowflake photos he'll share during photo sharing time. And we're just going to kind of go crazy. All kinds of stuff happening. And, and as usual, we're taking live questions. I'll show you how to do that on, on Stuck in Customs very soon. Uh, but first, let's have everyone just kind of introduce themselves and uh, you know plug away and, and this sort of thing. We'll just go, let's go from Brian's direction over to Thomas's direction. So Brian, you you start for us. Cool. Well, thanks, Trey. Uh, my name is Brian Matias. I, uh, as Trey mentioned, I am the newest acquisition of uh, Google. I'm I'm the new community manager for Google Plus Photos. So uh, every Thing that everyone here loves about photography, that's kind of my uh, my MO now. So, uh, oh. yeah, no, it's uh, it's great. You know, I, I've spoke to a few of you offline in the whole process here, so I really always appreciate um, the good guidance that everyone gave me. And thus far, I'm on uh, day six, and uh, it is a, a ridiculously amazing place to be. Very wow. cool. All right. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm on Google Plus. That's that's where you should find me. Yeah, we've heard of that. Okay, Don, you're next. Hello, uh, I'm Don Komarechka, also known as that Snowflake guy. Uh, I've the, the winter time. The last three months have been pretty much dedicated exclusively to photographing one and one thing only is snowflakes. And you'll see a bunch of those later. Um, you can check out my website at doncom.ca, but I'm most active on Google Plus, uh, where I'm also trying to uh, crowdfund a book project, which we'll talk more about. Uh, I want to ask uh, another one of the guests on the panel a couple of questions. Yes, Kate knows a thing or two about that. Um, okay, now, Gino, go for it. Well, I am Gino, but you all know that. And, you know, this last week, I couldn't make the show last week because I was on death's door, and I was very, I was out of it, and uh, couldn't speak. I was pretty depressed because, as you guys know, I think it goes without saying, I'm a health nut. You know, I'm into the working out, and uh, I keep my body like a temple. And so when I got sick, I was kind of like, how do you know I've done everything right you know I've earned health so how is it I'm sick I get some of you slobs out there but no, how is this happening to me so I was sitting around eating a box of cornflakes feeling sorry for myself because of the minerals you know you eat a box of cornflakes that's like two or three days worth of minerals right there so I was trying to get healthy and I was watching TV and this is where I told Trey before the show, I said, I really feel like I came to an epiphany. I was watching The Karate Kid because that's some good, I'm sick stuff to watch right there. And what happened was I got all the way through the movie. You know, Mr. Miyagi at one point, you know, he's up, he's on the, you know, Daniel San sees Mr. Miyagi doing the crane maneuver. And he asked Mr. Miyagi about it. What's the deal with this? And he tells him it's the crane maneuver. And Daniel says, you know, is it, is it good? And Mr. Miyagi says, famously, if do right, no can defend. Right? So daniel San wants to learn the crane maneuver. So he does. And at the very end, can you guys see my screen capture here? Yes. yes. Sure. All right. So, so you know the famous scene here. Here's daniel San, the dude from Cobra Kai. His boys are in the background screaming, sweep the knee. You know? And Daniel Song goes into the crane. <laughs> Put him and... in a body bag. Put him in a body bag. <laughs> so Daniel is sitting there in the crane. You know, Miyagi's freaking out because he's like, oh, my God, Okinawa's coming home to roost right here. He's fixing to go upside this dude's face. Here, I'm sick as a dog, right? In the meantime, right at this moment, when Daniel Song's about to unleash on his face, my son comes up and he's like bugging me. He's like, Dad, I'm hungry. Can you get me a sandwich? So I, so I pause the DVR. I go make my son a sandwich. I come back. And what I realized in this moment 
is that Mr. Miyagi was full of crap. Because when I saw my TV frozen in this exact moment that you're looking at right here, I realized even if do right, can defeat. Because all the Cobra Kai dude had to do was wait daniel son out. And if daniel son had stood there long enough, he'd have got a cramp in his right back. And when daniel son falls over, Cobra Kai just goes over and just takes him out. And the whole... So that's when I realized, you know what? Sometimes, even when do right, can defeat. So... That was my revelation. That is the title of the show. <laughs> if do right, can defeat. Nice. So anyway, that's it for me. Uh, that's what I realized getting sick. Well said, Gino. All right. All right. Next um, is an even more impressive guest than you, Gino, somehow. Uh, this is uh, Kate Russell, and I guess we first accidentally ran into each other about five or six years ago. You did a piece on stuckincustoms.com on the BBC and it got us this huge group of followers in London that's just grown over time. So I, I owe you a ton. Thank you. Kate. <laughs> Do you know, it's one of the most awesome things about my job for the BBC. So yeah, I'm, I'm Kate Russell. I'm going to find it really hard to follow Gino's story, actually. Maybe I should do it like this. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm in London, close to London. It's three o'clock in the morning. Yes, thank you for that foot. Lovely. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I, for, since uh, the beginning of 2006, I've been reviewing websites and, and apps for the BBC on their uh, technology show Click Weekly. Um, I've done something like 600 episodes, um, and yeah, Stuck in Customs was one of the early websites that I reviewed, and a review on Click can often get you, uh, I think it was about between five and 10,000 hits over a weekend when it goes on air, so which for a, you know, a little startup website is, uh, is really a lot, and, um, and and I consider myself to be quite honoured to be able to sort of spread that love. Um, it's also quite a responsibility working for the BBC and making sure you get it right. Um, there's been some spectacular um, mistakes and errors over the years, which I won't go into. But um, yeah, you have to be very careful of typos and URLs. That's all I'm going to say because um, it can go very nasty otherwise. Um, uh, I, I once covered a website called uh, rasterbeta.org um, and I'll let you guess what the typo uh, for that one um, is where you know when you rasterize an image you make it big and with lots of dots and you sort of print it out so yeah I'll let you I'll let you make your own conclusions as to where that one ended up because of a typo. Well, I, I don't get it. What? <laughs> <laughs> Am I the only guy? She ended up making something yeah. else big. Gino, just right. do that long enough and you'll get it right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so um, as well as doing this stuff for the BBC, I've just uh, published my first book, Work in the Cloud, which is a collection of tools, tips, and resources, around 300 tools, tips, and resources for using the internet. It's aimed at small businesses because publishers like pigeonholes, but actually it's good for anyone who wants to, to use the internet better and smarter. Um, and I've just uh, started work on a sci-fi novel because I did a very successful Kickstarter over Christmas and got funded 400% to write and record uh, and write write the book and record an unabridged audio book uh, based on the Elite Game Universe. Uh, so um, that happened over Christmas. So it's all really really exciting at the moment. And um, the uh, the Elite Game. Universe? Yeah, Elite. It's a great game. Don't you? I used to play it all the time on my Amiga. Man, I love I'm surprised it. I haven't been invited by default. That's curious. Well, it's, we're talking, I mean, 1984 was when it first came out, which is when I got into it. And it was, I, it mm. got me into games on the BBC Micro, got me into computers and technology on the BBC Micro, and was really the first sandbox type game, um, you know, which is, uh, if you think Grand Theft Auto is, is today's sort of typical sandbox type adventure game, where you, it, it's sort of a never ending topography on which you can explore and do little mini missions and you can play it however you like and and previous to Elite really the main games were all arcade ports which were all sort of queen drop fed you know three lives in a certain amount of time and then the game's over so it was really a revolution um, back in 1984 um, and they did a kickstarter at, at the end of last year to fund making the next uh, version of it uh, 21 years after the, the, the last version I will I will point out 
Um, and they actually got funded 1.25 million. Well, in the end, it was 1.6 million. They got the, the highest funded ever requested target of a Kickstarter to date. There have been other Kickstarters that have funded more that asked for less, but they were the, the highest sort of requested funded that made their, their total. So, And as part of that, they were selling the license to buy, to write a piece of fiction based in the game world for £4,500 pledge tier. And people were running Kickstarters to fund their Kickstarter pledge tier, which was all a bit kind of weird. And the press got a bit kind of like, mm, don't really get this. Um, but 10 books got funded in this way. And there are now 10 of us authors all frantically writing our, our elite sci-fi novels to uh, coincide with the launch of the game in March next year. So That's awesome. Elite was great. I remember I was in high school at Jesuit, which was this all-boy uh, Catholic school. And because there was no girls, it was harder to get in trouble. So the way I got in trouble is I would sneak into the computer lab and play Elite all the time. Greatness. Great memory. Yeah, no, absolutely. It really was a... It was a, a a game changer is probably, uh, you know, it's a bit of a, it's a game changer. Yes, it was. It was the first game changer. It was really the first proper game on a computer and, and, and saved me from a, a life of probably um, prison or something because I was not very good at school and I was getting into trouble a lot. And I went to a girls' school and uh, we, we learned home economics and needlework. Um, and I actually got to learn how to iron a man's shirt in one of my lessons. So um, that didn't please me very much, but yeah, Elite, Elite actually gave me an outlet apart from trying to disrupt my uh, my school life, so it was good. You know, Trey, when you, when you said that the next guest was more awesome than me, I had my doubts, but Kate Russell is more awesome than me. <laughs> there can be no question about that. Yeah. Why, thank you. Yeah. If, if we yeah, could just get her to sing some of that British lady songs, that would be even better. Which British lady? Who's that? She's the chick. She's the big Adele? heavy chick. Adele. Adele. Some, yeah. Think some Adele stuff. <laughs> I do I mean you could, karaoke, actually, but people I know you can. stop singing. <laughs> oh, I know you can do it. Anyway, just a now, thought. We're going to talk all about your new book, Working the Cloud, because I know there's a ton of people watching that, you know, kind of want to live more of their life on the Internet and make money over the Internet with their photography. And So you address all this stuff in your book. We'll get to it. But first, let's introduce these next two. Um, Ollie, go. Hello. Um, yes, I'm Ollie. I'm a photographer and filmmaker uh, in New Zealand. Um, I was uh, delighted to meet Trey when he came out and shifted out to Queenstown. Um, so it's been great to have him in our country for a while, so that's really cool. Um, I'm on today because I'm nearly finished uh, editing a documentary I've been filming called Virtually Famous, and it's uh, on my shirt. And it's a documentary about social media from the point of view of a sort of a, an unknown photographer in New Zealand looking out to the world, seeing people like Trey and, and Philip Bloom and Nino Leitner and a whole bunch of people, Vincent Lafare, and, and following them on, on social media and then just wondering one day, how did they get there and, you know, is, it, is, is there a, a, a formula to that or, you know, what are, what are their opinions on, on everything? And what's been really interesting is that everyone has said something completely different. So I've really enjoyed the process of interviewing some of the people that I um, have been influenced by. And um, I've also found out in the process that I'm a creative. I'm not an editor. So I'm now stuck in the editing process and it's really bogging me down. But um, I'm getting there and I'm nearly finished. So can't wait to share it with you. That sounds interesting. I can't wait to see that. Mm. I'm busy on Wednesdays, but if you want to contact me on Thursdays, sure, yeah. I'd be Should happy. Just do it to... over, over Google right. Plus Hangout. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. That'll work just for push me. Push record. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Well, speaking of social media followers, you know who is next is this guy. I'm going to share my mm -hmm. screen. Look at this. He has just passed Tom Anderson. He has wow. 4.658 million followers. This guy. Way past Madonna and Usher and Hugh Jackman and Richard Branson. Come on, who are these people? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> this, is, this is the man right there, Thomas Hawk. Who, who wow. is he behind immediately, though? I, I don't know. <laughs> Who's number six? I, I don't yeah, know. Look, Tom, Tom's already got big plans. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm Thomas Hawk. You can find me on Google Plus or 
Flickr or Facebook or Tomashawk.com or wherever. I like Stocksy. Stocksy, right. Stocksy. I love Stocksy. It's a new <laughs> thing. Yeah, we talked all about you last week, Thomas. You didn't join us for our Stocksy discussion. I know. I was in Idaho. I was stuck at a dinner with Robert Scoble in Idaho. And yeah, his new Android. Android. Which answer, it's a self answering question, right? Where were you? Oh, Idaho. Idaho? Sorry. <laughs> no. no, it was good. It was good. I, I went up to Idaho and hung out with the Scobalizer. Well, that's cool. All right, Kate. Now, tell everybody uh, why they should buy your book. I think they should buy your book, but why don't you give us your, your elevator pitch and why this thing is so, so awesome? Okay, well. I guess I wrote it because having spent the last seven years literally surfing the internet, I mean, if I, if I hadn't been paid by the BBC to do it, I probably would have been locked away in one of those Scandinavian addiction clinics by now. Um, and I was becoming a bit of a dinner party bore, right? So every time anyone says anything, I go, oh, there's an app for that, or oh, there's a website for that. I was, um, oh, God. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, I even got once, I was in a, an emergency room with my, um, in a hospital with my friend, and they came over the tannoy and said, um, uh, does anyone in, in the emergency room speak Spanish? And I was like, well, no, but I've got an app that will translate for you. So I'm literally, I am, there's an app for that girl. And, um, and I decided instead of boring everybody with it, I would write it down in a book. Um, and yeah, so it's 10 chapters. The chapter's kind of, I didn't want to do a boring, it's called Working the Cloud. I'm going to actually screen share the website uh, if, you, if you want to have a quick look at that. Um, screen, I haven't done screen sharing very much. Um, so I've got the, the companion website as well, which is here, which I'm going to sort of be building up um, more reviews and news stories and opinion pieces um, as I go along. That's all free. Um, there's also apps. I've got uh, an iPhone app and an Android app, which you download and you get full video interviews of it, some really amazing interviews that I've done for the book with people like Theo Pathetis and Martin Lewis, the money saving man. Um, um, so there's all sorts of really interesting stuff on that website as well, and that's free. You don't have to buy the book to do that. Um, but the book kind of, I didn't want it to be a dull business book, so I've kind of. Oh, so a sneak preview of the uh, of, of my uh, recommendation later. Um, I didn't want it to be a dull, boring business book, so I've kind of written it with a narrative, I hope, and and sort of reasons why you should look at these websites and and sort of you know a bit of stories and anecdotes that explain a little bit about the industry and why I have such a massive passion for computers and technology, um, and what I think that they bring to my life in the hope that it will will interest you. In your life as well. I mean, I'm 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 going to be on BBC Radio tomorrow, and and they read it, and they they actually said to me today, they tweeted me today, and said it's like the internet for dummies, only not for dummies, which I kind of like that uh, that explanation. So, um, yeah. So basically, it's ten chapters. Starts off with, you know, why you should be online, how to get online, which elements you should secure. Then the next few chapters go into sort of social media and how to run a good campaign. And, and, you know the various different tools that you can use to analyze and gather people to you um, but then after we cover um, sort of like the social media side and marketing side by chapter four I'm kind of saying right okay that's not what it's all about though it's just you know there's loads of stuff productivity stuff uh, you know Know, things that will make your life easier, more organized. There's a whole chapter on virtual assistants, sort of like all, all the stuff that exists to do your job for you online. Um, and then the final chapter actually goes into um, how to make money online. So, um, and there's a few nice apps in there for photo journalism and stuff like that as well. So, um, actually, ways that you can make not the next dot com millionaire, but um, you know, if you want to make a trickle income, um, it's aimed at really people who are struggling to find a job maybe or you know people who want to take control of their life and maybe strike out on their own um, or even if you're running a small business or running a department within a bigger business it's you know sort of all stuff that will help you be more effective in your job and 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 save more time so that you don't have to spend it in front of the computer actually as well so and then and then hopefully make a bit of money too so, Kate, I have some questions for you. I know other guests do too. I let me for people that are watching. Let me show you how you can ask questions, and we can see them. I'm going to share my screen. 
So we have this, uh, speaking of the cloud, here we have this cool thing called Google Moderator. If you're stuck in customs.com, um, underneath the live embedded show, we have this thing. So you can come ask questions and you can upvote or downvote questions like dig. And uh, Dave and I will be watching these. So you can ask um, Kate or uh, anybody else, anything that you, you like. Uh, oh, let me share this other thing with you. So I've been looking at the book, Kate. Let me share again. So I'm clicking around like a madman. There's this chapter here that you refer to chapter six. The uh, money, the money cloud. cloud. And so this chapter is all about saving money as opposed to making money. Uh, Martin Lewis, the money saving expert, is the interview featured in that chapter. Um, yeah, so it's all about the, the ways that you can save money. Yes, what have you found uh, is was some of the best ways to save money? Uh, well, for starters, not paying full premium uh, price uh, for software. You know, when you first set up an office, you're going to spend six, seven hundred English pounds of your English pounds. I don't know what that is in Australian or New Zealand uh, dollars, but um, uh, yeah, you're going to spend a lot of money just setting up your office. And there's an awful lot of stuff out there now that is open source and free. Uh, you know, or at the very least, there's sort of you know. You, they call them freemium model things where you get the basic tools for free and then you, if you want to enhance them you can add on for a, for a premium price. So there's an awful lot of stuff that exists out there that lets you do all that for free and you don't have to. You know I even talk about Linux uh, you know and setting up a Linux box and the, the good distros for a basic entry level Linux experience which isn't too dissimilar to, to Windows for example. Um, you know, an open office for your for your for your word processing suite and 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 general office requirements as well. And then there are free and open source email clients and and all that kind of stuff. So as well as it's called working the cloud. It's not just stuff that exists in the cloud, but I'm kind of like broadening out the term a little bit and trying to reclaim it from the enterprise mob um, and and say that the the internet itself is the mother of all clouds. So as you well know, as all the great. There's some great freemium software I found the other day called Photoshop on this site called Bootcamp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great, and where you can process photos on it. I love the freemium model. I actually think well, they see that that that, that free um, Photoshop's actually quite old now, but you can get quite a, a really good piece of software called GIMP, which is uh, completely free. And uh, Aviary is good. But yeah, there, there's there's loads and loads of stuff out there that that allows you to do that, and and then as well as the stuff that, you know, one of the aspects as well, I think for for a lot of people starting out on their own is whether or not they can afford an office, for example, and you know one of the things I cover in the in the the money saving chapter is all about this whole idea of the cappuccino commerce, they call it, where you don't necessarily, if you're starting out on your own, you know, if you're a photographer and you're looking for business, you don't need to set up an office. You can, you know, move from cafe to cafe, jumping on their free Wi-Fi, and, you know, and there, and there are also places that you can hire or even just go and sort of, you know, use their facilities, office facilities, for a very small price. And there are apps that help you find that kind of stuff, location-based apps. So there's all that as well. If you if you want to actually really strike out on your own, but you don't want to set up set up an office uh, and 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 have all the expense of that on your overheads, then you can do it for free. You can just go uh, go cafe surfing, and um, and uh, it's it's a growing trend at the moment. They call it cappuccino co commerce, which I rather like that idea. As long as you drink yeah, a coffee and. Over. Yeah, yeah, in the U.S., everyone does it. I remember back in Austin, almost any coffee shop you go to, everyone's just sitting alone, but with other people. On yeah, what was that one, Trey? Your, the coffee shop you took me to? Um, Probably on Mozart. The Mozart's. Mozart's, yeah. yeah. That was great. great you, I remember you said that. It's like everyone comes together to be alone, and I was like, that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Kate, do you notice this as a, a growing trend that more and more people are starting to start a, a second business or a third business, like, on the internet, so they have their sort of their real life, and then they have just sort of this fantasy life on the internet where they're trying to get something going, either for the love of it or sometimes for money. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's really it's much more realistic now as well. I mean, there there are a lot of ways that you can make money, you know, out of your hobby, for example, out of your hobby rather. For example, if you you know, there are a lot of photographers and photography fans watching this. You you there are. I mean, in in the book, actually, page two hundred. I've I've marked it, and I'm just going to read them out. 
there are there's a whole bunch of stuff that I've put in about citizen journalism that allows you to sell or have an outlet for your photographs um, and make some money and if you're if you're taking those photos anyway and you're putting them online and sharing them anyway I guess my point is you're not going to necessarily get rich overnight doing this but if you can bring in a second income without really changing your lifestyle in any great way great way then um, you know everybody's lives are going to get easier in these challenging economic times so there's things like um, demotics.com and shutterstock.com that's two uh, that allow you to Kate, I gotta disagree with you here. I'm telling you, if you've got a Hobbit and you're posting some some pictures of that thing online, you got an income stream right there, baby. I don't know what you're doing with that Hobbit, but you need to get that thing front and center on what in front of whatever you're doing. That needs to be your new book. What kind of Hobbit do you have? <laughs> Well, it's it's not one with hairy enough feet, unfortunately. So it's um, <laughs> no it's... no crane kick for him. All right. No I crane kick for him. No. Hey, no. hey, we do. We have a scoop for you and the BBC. You can you can jam this into the BBC. They'll love it. Go uh, on. Thomas and I will now tell you about something much better than Shutterstock.com or Getty. <laughs> we'll tell you about something called Stocksy, and this Stocksy. needs to take over. Yeah. It's already taking over the U.S. and Silicon <laughs> Valley and and Thomas and I are on board, and all these other people are on board. The thing is that Shutterstock and Getty, highway robbery, you only get like a very small percentage of sure. each sale, but at Stocksy, you get 50%. Tell, the, tell her more, Thomas. Yes, yes. Tell so me Stock more. I'm writing this down. I yeah. know. So, so Stocksy, which you guys talked about last week, but which launched, uh, I guess, last Monday, um, so a week ago, is a new co-op site. And so photographers can post their work on there and they get paid 50% payouts. And um, at the end of the year, they look at the profits. They use part of the money to run the stock agency. And whatever's left, they pay back to the uh, photographers as a dividend. How do you spell that? S-T-O-C-K-I-S-I? S-I? S-T-O-C-K-S-Y. So Trey and I are doing this and Brian's doing it too. I am. He's on there, yeah. and uh, there's a lot of a lot of really great photographers, and um, you know I love the co-op model. I love you know being able to you know Getty's paltry payouts at twenty percent are just ridiculous. And well, this is it. I mean, this is doing video. Uh, no, just uh, just stock photography right now, but it's. Uh, <laughs> but it's correct me if I'm wrong. Ninety nine out of every hundred people that own a camera have been accepted to Stocksy.com. <laughs> is that correct? Yes, Gino is right. It did no, no. no they, unfortunately, they are being very, uh, very selective, or fortunately, or unfortunately. But um, so it's not for everybody. But yeah, it's, it's not for everybody. Enough. Yeah. This but this is great. This is one of the things that I've been complaining about with these apps. Is you know, it's really only ever for the hobbyist um, and the hobbitist um, because you do get <laughs> such a small cut. So, um, but that's great. I'll have a look at that. That'll be on Webscape. Yeah, here it is. I'm, I'm going to look at that myself right now. Uh, Kate, you can see what this looks like. Um, these are some footprints in the sand, and people can you know buy the photo. Um, this is just one. Uh, I think uh, uh, you know Thomas has hundreds and hundreds of images up there, and and I'm slowly feeding it and. Uh, I think well, the, everyone in this hangout is feeding it except for Gino, who has been rejected. That's correct. Yeah, I actually, I think that I am actually the. I, I actually take pride in this. I think I'm the only person that Stocksy has rejected so far. Not true. So, <laughs> not true. I, I haven't. Uh, I haven't checked it out yet, but I'm definitely going to as soon as this. Oh, is you'll be in. accepted. Don't worry. <laughs> I, yeah, is it I, open to? Is it international or is it just U.S.? I don't remember. No, they're Canadian. Well, they're Canadian. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yeah. there you go. It's international, uh, I, I have a few of my uh, photographs that ended up on covers of like scientific journals that I got paid a dollar for from Getty. And uh, and that just really hey, digs a knife into you. So uh, I'll, I'll hey, have to hey, look Hey, Don, what is that uh, picture behind you there, the, the triple picture? Uh, that is an abandoned uh, building in the mountains of Bulgaria uh, that I broke into last year. That's what I was going to guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, I know it's a no-brainer. I shouldn't even need to explain it, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a close-up look at that actual shot here. Um, yeah, well, the sickle and hammer on the roof was a clue. 
Yeah, that'll kind of give it away a little bit. Uh, so this is in the isolated mountains of uh, of Bulgaria. They they used to be wow. a communist uh, country, and uh, this is built like uh, you got to take fifteen hairpin turns up this isolated mountain, and then hike up a cliff and find break in through a, a hole in the wall. And it's uh, well, it's That's a fun place. That's pretty cool. That so is awesome. Like Trey's place in Queenstown, actually. Yeah, Trey's got a couple of places like that. <laughs> Well, hey, you know what I thought that was when I first saw it? Uh, here, we got to get back to Kate in just a second, but I do want to go down this little rat hole because it's cool. That picture behind you reminded me of this place. So I've got this, I've got this Pinterest board. I've started to keep track of places I want to go uh, someday. Oh, look at that place, by the way. Awesome. So, Because wow. um, I used to have this text list of places I wanted to visit, but I thought, oh, that's a mess. So now I'm collecting really cool photos of really – look at this place. This is this beach. Um, anyway, I'm distracting myself. Uh, let me find this one. There's this place in Russia. It's a missile factory. That's, look at this. This is it. Some girl uh, snuck into this place, and she broke in. They used to build missiles in there. And if I click through, look at that thing. There are a lot of girls on Pinterest, have you noticed? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of gals. A lot of girls like, sneaking into oh. missile silos these days, too, I've noticed. That's like something out of a Star Wars movie, isn't it? That's crazy. Yeah. There's a, uh, she has a whole website here. You guys can still see my screen. Yeah, it's loading mm -hmm. up here. Yep. Come on, internet. Yeah, look at this place. See, she snuck in here. She took all these selfies. Look at that. Awesome. Look at that. Gotta go. Wow. Jeez. Can you imagine what kind of selfies Lotus Carroll could take inside of an abandoned missile silo in Russia? <laughs> <laughs> the mind reels. Uh, I know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. What kind of bathrooms do they have there? <laughs> I you, don't know. I think you I might need a. Pro I think you might need a property release if you want to sell it on Stocksy, though. <clears throat> probably do. You probably. I had a few rejected from Stocksy for that very reason. Yeah. Um, Way to bring it Don, down, Thomas. <laughs> Don, you had a question for Kate about um, uh, crowdfunding a, a book. Well, yeah. Well, because I'm crowd funding a book and I know uh, that Kate had recently done that as well and was very very successful at it and uh, those things can go uh, either way you know it, you're thrilled if you succeed with the funding but you you said you hit 400 percent and I'm wondering if you could give anybody any tips to uh, to be a little bit more successful in that kind of a project sure I did so the the, the project was um, it was called mostly harmless uh, and I'll, I'll just share it with you just so that you can see um, what it was so this was my Kickstarter here and as you can see there I got um, seventeen thousand pounds of a four thousand two hundred and forty two goal funded by eight hundred and eleven backers and that's the key right the key here is really if you have a look at these numbers here so we've got Updates are what you feed through your sort of, you know, go out to all of your investors and, and keep them up to date with what's going on. Then you've got the number of backers and then you've got the number of comments. And that's, uh, I've got 1,500 comments and 27 updates. Um, and that's really key is it's a very social experience for your investors. And the, the thing to remember is that they can drop out at any time. You know, they put their money in, they put, you know, they, 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 you need to be, you need to tell it like a story, to tell, tell the Kickstarter or, or, the, or the crowdfunding project like a story. Make the pledges interesting and fun to participate in. Like my top pledge was for two hundred pounds. People could have a revenge killing where they get to name one of the characters in the book, knowing that they're going to die in a really grisly and spectacular way. Um, so you know, I've had people naming their ex-girlfriends um, and stuff like that to be killed off in my book. Um, so um, it's kind of it, one of my followers actually described it as a bit like performance art. The whole process of the Kickstarter. So it, it, it helps that I'm on television, and it helps that I've got a, a, a good, healthy following, but I only got 811 people to invest in me, and actually that's not too big a stretch, even if you're not on television. You need to know, you need to have a plan for, for getting the message out there, and you need to make your, your Kickstarter project. It's no good just having a good idea. You've got to make the project itself entertaining and engaging to participate in and you've got to give them constant feedback I mean the whole process for the for the six weeks the Kickstarter was running it was a bit like having a really demanding 
boyfriend, you know, 811 really demanding boyfriends, you know, they got really antsy if I wasn't speaking to them enough or if I, you know, if I went off radar for a few days because I was busy with work or whatever, then people would start going, oh, she's, she's ignoring us now. So it's really, you, you get a really intense relationship with these people. But if you can play that right and if you can get engage them on the right level, they will sell your project for you. You know, I had probably a core of about 20 or 30 people who were constantly marketing my project for me. Um, well, because they want a copy of it themselves, right? Exactly, because they, they'd invested, they put their money where their mouth was, and they were enjoying the process of the, of the Kickstarter to such an extent day by day as it went on that they wanted it to succeed so it's not good enough just to have a great idea and put a project up there and hope people will come it's also not good enough just to keep promoting it out and gather your social media to you the best strategy is to get a core of people invested and then entertain those people through the Kickstarter or through the Indiegogo platform that you're using and they will be your marketing force for you but you need to keep them entertained and engaged the whole way through because at any moment they can all drop out <laughs> which okay, is really I scary. I think you got 400 percent because you used a cat in your video. <laughs> yeah. oh. Cat playing elite. It, yes, indeed. It's this is this is like Reddit gold here. Cat <laughs> and elite. Come on. I, I, I need to add a cat to my video. Uh, I think that's what I'm missing. I'm, I'm actually doing yeah. a, a book campaign myself uh, with all of my snowflake images, and it's one of those things that uh, it, it's taken off, and it's halfway through, and it's doing quite well so far. Um, but it, you know, I find that there's a certain lack of engagement, and I'm trying to build it up to get a certain you know involvement from the community to help it just spiral to a, a greater success. And it's one of those things that's difficult to do sometimes. So I appreciate your tips on that. I'll have to. How many, have to how add many more cats. comments have you posted? You, I, I saw on your there. It's twenty comments in total you you need to be driving that comments thread you need to be engaging them as if it were a forum Oh yeah, well you know I, I'm active in, in many other ways. A lot of these people funnel into this project but then they follow it on, on Facebook or Google Plus and they'll be sharing on Google Plus and that's where a lot of my interaction comes from. And I've made some updates and I gotta do more of that. I gotta keep you know, the involvement on every scale of the project uh, you know, in order just to keep that momentum going. And you're right, it's almost like a full-time job just keeping <laughs> everything in order, keeping everybody happy and, and, and trying to you know, go down every single road you can to make it a success. You know, the one thing that I see, uh, and this is the first time I've inter ever interacted with Don and Kate, and this goes back to what Ollie was talking about with the book he's writing, is that both you and Kate, already I can see you guys have a lot of energy, and you're very positive. Um, you, you know, you're interesting immediately to listen to and to watch. You're engaging. And so I think that's very critical for people who are going to make a success of something like that, is you, you have to be engaging to get people to be interested in whatever it is you're doing. And both of you two are interesting immediately. Just in this short time I've hung out with you guys, you're already interesting. Oh, thank you. The check is in the mail. Thanks, yeah. that's what I was going for. <laughs> you, know, you know, Gino, you're interesting too. Well, apparently not interesting enough, Tom. <laughs> I can tell you're interesting. Look at all the books you've got behind you. You obviously read a lot. Yeah, I've got... So just got totally I've got all, all, all of the Dr. Seuss books. Um, anyway, <laughs> I think I see a Where's Waldo in there. Yeah, Cat in the Hat, uh, Rock the Doodle. Do you know the gun? Where's the gun? Actually, I just got two new guns today, but whatever. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Actually, Kate, I, I made the same um, sort of revelation ha happen to me when I was doing my, my documentary. I thought I'd try out Kickstarter, and I had never even been on the website before someone just said you need to go and try it and I set up this campaign and pushed go and within 24 hours knew exactly what was required it was basically a full-time job and I was petrified by how much work was involved in getting this thing out because it's not just I thought you went on this website and you put out your project and sat back and watched the cash roll and <laughs> that's just from living down under I guess just it, a little bit slow it does take yeah. some work the last Kickstarter I donated to, though, was for Google to hire Brian as their community. <laughs> <laughs> I donated oh, hundred bucks. What, what do I owe you now? I know that. Were you an early yeah, don't, bird? Don't worry, you don't have to pay for another year. Where does that tattoo go? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Yeah, you get to you get to name your mortal enemies at Google, and uh, Brian will beat them up. That's what exactly. happens. Yeah. Yeah, it was sad actually. Today I got a, a, a message from Kickstarter. I don't know if you followed the um, the uh, project for a um, a Death Star uh, was uh, they somebody put up a crowdfunding the Death Star and they were looking for something like six hundred billion dollars and you know pledge tiers were starting at one dollar. So obviously it wasn't serious, but that that failed today. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't make the uh, required six hundred million um, dollars. How high did it get? I think it got to, it got to about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It did pretty well. The funniest thing was then a couple of days later, somebody uh, started a Kickstarter for a fleet of X-wing fighters to defend against the Empire. So yeah. it was, uh, yeah. Hey Kate, I wonder a what happened if you start from... Kickstarter to be Sorry, Dave. What were you saying? Well, I wonder what would happen if you tried to start a Kickstarter to start a Kickstarter competitor. <laughs> <laughs> wow! That's oh, the point. cynic. There'd be some kind of, uh, the whole universe would implode in on itself, I think. The, the, the crowdfunding universe would sort of like disappear up its own backside in a puff of smoke. I don't know, but I made a, I made a post about Stocksy on Getty and they banned me. Yep. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. They don't like competitors. Yeah. <laughs> or competition. Yeah, Tom Getty's not in my book, by the way. I just wanted you. I don't know where Getty came from. Getty's not in my book. I haven't spoken about Getty in my book. Good. They're evil. Folks, <laughs> scoop shots were the ones. Um, but I wish I wish you told me. Well, I wish you'd come up with this. So I finished writing this in October. So you're a little bit late off the. Well, uh, Stocks is brand new. They just launched on Monday. So. No, it's Listen cool. It's very cool. I'm definitely going to share. In, in the age of the internet, anything you say is immediately outdated, you know, two weeks later, so. Hey, so, uh, Kate, there's a question here. It came mm. in from St. John, Indiana, from Joey BLS. He was wondering, uh, what, what are some of the, the best uh, success stories you've heard about uh, e-books? People that have published books just just on the internet. What have you, uh, do you have any swan songs you know of? Um, there was, and I can't remember the name of her, but there was a woman last year, an American lady, who the, it, the story did the news rounds because she suddenly became like uber wealthy and bought, you know, sort of a, a mansion in Malibu or something. And oh, she, she, she was the publisher of that thing called Flat Books. I read that. <laughs> she, she'd been plugging away for years. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what it, yeah, what it was. Didn't no. she publish flat books and bought a mansion and made millions of dollars? <laughs> no, I think the wrong person she's talking about is Nicole S. Young. <laughs> <laughs> nice, successful yeah. ebooks. Yeah. She and makes it. Not talking about many shades of grey or whatever that is either. Um, no. No, 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 let's no. keep going with that line though. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> But yeah, they, so they, she, she'd written like nine novels and had them all, all turned down. They were really pretty pappy kind of like um, romance novels and she's had them all turned down and she just decided to self-publish and suddenly like loads of people bought them. Um, I can't remember the name of her, I'm afraid. Yeah, a lot of people find that when they self-publish that pappy stuff goes better. So. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's easy. You've really got to make it. it go clique. I, I saw they had the Thirty Shades of Grey book at Costco the other day. Yeah, but it was only twenty nine. I think when you get at Costco, they don't give you all. <laughs> twenty nine is more than enough, though, isn't it? I mean, I, I can't get past two, I'm, and I'm at two. You know? <laughs> I don't know. You guys down in in the southern hemisphere are being cheated because we have Fifty Shades of Grey here, and just saying. Mm. Yeah, wow. Gino likes the 40% off version. Yeah. <laughs> I just go to half price books and call it a day. Yeah. London is very gray. So, yes. uh, Brian, uh, give us yes. a little uh, uh, Google Plus, Google Photos scoop. Tell us what your first week has been like. What are you, what are and you tell planning? Us, uh, what's going tell on? Tell us some inside information, too. Stuff you're not supposed to say yet. Oh, yeah. I mean, a, a week is really all you ever need at Google, so I might as well just start spilling stuff and <laughs> just end it. <laughs> um, it's been, it has been an intense uh, intense week. Uh, they uh, 
Google. Fifty Shades of Google. Yeah, no. In my first week, I think the first month you're classified as a noogler, so I went through my noogler training. Yeah. Don't you have to wear a hat or something? Some weird hat? Yeah, Nicole's going to actually get a... It's on the dresser. Um, it's, it's actually pretty cool. But, um, no, the... It's great because, you know, going in there and already being familiar with, with the network and the community and that kind of stuff, um, you, I was able to kind of... Yeah. There. there it is. That's the Noodler hat. Put that thing on and wear it. Yeah, we got to... <laughs> Own it, Brian. No, you're right. Because I actually couldn't make it to the, the final orientation where everyone was wearing these. I had too many meetings, but... Um, Spin the propeller. Come on. Yes. <laughs> Is that compatible with the glass? Oh, there should be like an Android app or something that controls yeah. it. Can we get Nicole just there go is, on it while I talk to us? It yeah, there's nothing like getting my head swatted while I'm talking. Oh. <laughs> yeah. um, but just, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go the very safe route, Thomas, uh, here. Uh, but the long and short of it is, it's um it's pretty it's pretty unreal, uh, and that's just a gross understatement of what how talented these people are. And it's, what's cool is that it's a lot of people who we kind of know, like Vincent Mo, um, and, you know Josh Josh Haftel there now, um, and it's um watching everyone kind of do what they do to make uh, plus what it is, especially for photographers, is fantastic. Uh, and you guys saw what um, what was released. Technically, I guess. I guess in Australia is Australia the first place that hits the, the international dateline. Like when the new. Come on, please. Come on, dude. I don't know, New Zealand. Look, yeah, New Zealand, is, yeah. is, is is Canada <laughs> that place that has all those cool people? I don't know. Of course, yeah. Don, yeah, Don knows. I don't. I, don't know. I think it's Kamchatka. If you've ever played Risk, you know Kamchatka starts the whole thing going that way. But, you know, despite my utter lack of geography, um, when as soon as April 1st uh, started, you know, we had those kind of plus emotions. And, uh, and seeing that kind of being built out was something that was kind of cool and seeing it get launched by the engineer who built it was, was pretty sweet. Um, and then uh, and I'll just, I mean, just a really, really just a quick, just the pan. Oh, back. look but at you. That's about that's about as, as much as we're gonna get much I much. can't believe you did that while you're wearing that hat. Come on. I know, I know. Much I, I know. But but I, I made a promise and, and that's, that's kinda that's, that's kinda cool. nerd er, that's some nerd uber, uber coolness. Now let me did, have you already gotten some CIA seed money since you've started there? We'll talk offline about that. All right, cool. All right, I didn't know if that was. Well, cool I could to show you these cable tacos that Nicole got me. These little things that hold cables. I mean, that's that won't get me in trouble with Cord Google. Taco. Cord tacos. Uh, that's that's a good derailment of the conversation. Wow, way to bring it all down. <laughs> yeah, we, Do you like we that, Gino? Hear about your Google Glass than Nicole's cable taco. The Google right. Glass. Is, um, it, I, I, I talk about my tacos then. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Look, you know. Even um, gray there, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's my wife. Um, uh, the glass. You sounded like Borat there. <laughs> <laughs> I like. So, so, so Brian, Brian, what is the big push? Your uh, community manager of Google Plus Photos. Uh, you had the prerequisite for the proper first name, Brian. I think they only hire yeah. Brian's. As Trey says, a big stash to fill, and that's absolutely true. Right. But what, what, what's your agenda? What, what do you want to accomplish as community manager at Google? Uh, Google I mean, Google. twofold. First thing for me, like, I know that, and everyone should probably knows that, back in, what was it, September, October, when Google acquired uh, Nick, um, and there was this kind of like everyone was making this rush to say that, oh, it's another thing that, that um, was acquired and will be killed off and lo and behold my the first day I started was the, the same day coincidentally that they announced the new pricing structure um, but I want to make sure that the user base who um, either is an existing Nick customer or you know you know is interested about it I want to make sure that they feel comfortable and guiding the, the 
people who are already at Google who came from Nick, uh, guiding them to create uh, content to support uh, that user base. But more importantly, my, my really big kind of uh, nut to crack is um, to make sure that I really want to get um, the, really, I mean, you think kind of like in Google scale, I, I would like to get as many people in the world as possible uh, sharing and feeling comfortable sharing on uh, G+, uh, giving them the tools that, that, you know, will help them, you know, get excited to share. And that, that's, that's really what it is, is like this excitement to share photos. Um, to share photos on Google Plus instead of Facebook. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Brian, there's a question on uh, Stocking Customs from Sean Berry from Tribuca Canyon, California. The question is, BMASH, yeah. I love your photo blog. Are you going to still keep it up? Of course. Um, that's, a, that's actually a good question. I think, uh, I think it's important despite, you know, being kind of uh, client-facing or public-facing. I guess we don't have clients anymore. No, 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 no. But... Um, public facing that just because I'm there you still kind of want to uh, maintain uh, your own kind of archive your personal archive and um, so I'll maintain that but it, it, the same way I've done my personal workflow from the for the past uh, year and a half or so since plus launched and uh, Daniel Treadwell released that WordPress plugin as I initiate the post on plus and it kind of gets siphoned over to WordPress just kind of like as an archive so that won't stop now, now, Brian, when Google purchases Stocksy, will we all get trade our Stocksy equity in for Google <laughs> shares? Hey, Brian, are you still with are you, are you still with On One? Somebody wants to know, uh, I Terrence. Know it's, I, I, it's, I got that question a lot, and Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering the mechanics of the equity. The oh, equity sure, block. sure, yeah. <laughs> will, will our stock to equity be transferable into Google shares? Larry and I, we talk about it all the time. You know, we're right. good. Right. I, <laughs> oh, Brian, but, I, I do kind of want to know, how big is the team working at Google right now that is just, uh, you know, four photographers on Google Plus right now? How many people are, uh, are trying to take all of our words and, and make the system better? Uh, I know that you're working towards that goal, but, but how many others are there? Couple I don't know, the, in all honesty, and I'm being, I'm not being kind of coy or anything like that. I don't know the specific numbers. There are a lot of engineers. Um, uh, I'm the community manager, so the one I remember one of the first things I I saw, um, and that I actually want to go out and make a post about to that Don is, you know that send feedback button that everyone's trying to push you to. It is looked at. I mean, we we do look at it, and so. That's uh, in terms of a voice and making G plus better. By all means, um, make posts and 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 plus me so I can see them. But um, the feedback is what is like your direct line to all the product managers and the engineers. And obviously, if there's something that has a, a higher weight, or you you know that'll get looked at. But Don, let's be honest. Brian's been there a week. He doesn't even know where the good coffee is at that place. Oh, no. You know what? There's no shortage of good coffee. We're straight up, uh, the coffee, the, the micro kitchens, everything, uh, it'll be, I'll be a lot more rotund probably about the next time you see me. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Hey, what happened to Flakes? I thought somebody was going to talk about Flakes on this show. <laughs> Snowflakes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I got some of those. Um, yes, but our, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some snowflakes. Um, so actually right now I'm just looking outside and it's snowing right now so you're keeping me away from the little gems falling from the sky. But Are you mind. in Texas? Where do you live? Uh, I, I live in Barrie, Ontario. It's about an hour north of oh, Toronto. And, Mexico. Uh, All right. Yeah, just about. Um, so we, this is one of the last snowstorms of the, uh, the winter, but I've got hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of images that I, haven't, uh, that I haven't had a chance to edit yet. So I'll give you an example of um, do you, what Do you still consider it winter up there? Well, no, it's, it's been spring for about a week and a bit. But, uh, all right. It, it, it feels like winter when there's snow all over the place, uh, especially snow that's looks a little bit like this guy here. Um, th this is sort of the typical snowflake that I'll, I'll end up photographing, and there's a lot of cool, fun patterns uh, that you'll see inside one of these crystals, uh, a lot of yeah. geometry. That, uh, yeah, that doesn't even look real. 
I know that looks like a, like a composite, like you did a CAD drawing or something. Well, I'll right. take that as a compliment, I guess. No, um, no, take it, take it absolutely as a compliment because the fact that it it, it is real is it just drives me bon like that yeah. will it, right there that broken circle. I was what looking at some hell? Don stuff earlier today. I was looking around his, and I was like, "This stuff looks like he just photoshopped it in there." And that's from a but single there, exposure, right, Don? Well, no, it's not. Uh, there, uh, there's a lot of Photoshop work involved in these images. So, uh, in order to get this in focus from edge to edge, it requires about well, I'm going to say between 30 and 50 separate frames uh, that get combined together in order to bring everything into focus. And the reason for that is because at that level of magnification, you have almost nothing in focus. Uh, you have the tiniest little sliver of focus, a fraction of a millimeter. And every one of these snowflakes is photographed on an angle. And I'll, I'll show you why, because uh, you can play around, like the classic way of photographing snowflakes. So, so that is, picture right there is like 30 or 40 frames to make that? Uh, th this one right here is 28. Twenty eight. So you're doing like focus stacking? I'm doing focus you, stacking. Using on the stacker for that? No, I'm using Photoshop. Uh, oh, Photoshop. I, I would like Yes. Uh, there's so, so you're, software he, to do this, but he's using Photoshop, Ridlin, and Adderall to make these pictures. <laughs> That's what I'm <laughs> It's oh, just about crap. Um, this one is the sort of the classic way that a snowflake could be photographed. You know, you've got uh, a fairly transparent surface where you can see directly through, and in this case, it looks black because the background behind it is a homemade black mitten, and uh, and that's sort of the the classical. That, that's the way that they. Uh, I'll, I'll show you an image that comes right out of the camera, and you'll see how drastically different um, this kind of stuff actually will will be. This this is my Lightroom workflow. Uh, just as a quick little show off of uh, how they come out of the camera. Um, so that's one frame out of, uh, in this case, I think this was 28 frames. Yeah, 28 frames down here. Uh, those are the and fibers this is, from the glass, uh, from the glove? Yeah, those are the fibers from the glove. And uh, oh so th th God. this is the completed snowflake here. And uh, and this is, wow. uh, the colors that you see in here are, are often fun because this is, uh, you know, there's lots of science and physics involved in why you see colors in snowflakes. It has to do with optical interference uh, bouncing around between bubbles inside the ice. Uh, and the reason why I photograph them on an angle is so that I can see that. Normally, if you're photographing it straight on, then you're not going to be able to see any of those, uh, you know, reflective surfaces or optical interference and all the fun stuff that uh, that science will just bring out uh, uh, right out. Yeah, this one doesn't have any uh, optical interference stuff happening in the center, but it often, uh, you know, looks pretty cool with all the geometry all the same. You, you know, I totally want to. We're gonna start ramping up some cool stuff like chat. This is totally happening. Um, we need to have awesome. you. Yeah, we need to have you presenting on this. Oh, I, I'd love to. I'd absolutely love to. Uh, well, and the funny thing is about these that's images. Awesome. Uh, Don just got an offer to come work at Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'll, I'll see. I'll see Larry on Monday. We'll, they'll, nice, Brian. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll chat about it. What are the rest um, of us going to do to get jobs at Google? <laughs> <laughs> I'm and sorry. Silence. Sorry. Uh, I, I want to show you a couple of other fun things too. Uh, the, the snowflake that I had just shown you, um, the the one that was black and, and, and transparent. Uh, I'll show you the other version of it. This is the uh, the second shot that I had done, the second series on that same snowflake. Uh, so I've angled the flash just a couple of degrees differently, and it produces a reflective surface as opposed to a transparent one. Uh, just a couple of degrees difference will uh, drastically change what you're photographing, or at least how it looks, anyhow. Um, and you get all sorts of different levels of uh, of contours, and you can see relief patterns show up, and a little bit of optical interference, adding a splash of color. It's really a fun thing to do. Uh, but each of these images, to put these together, takes about four hours of work. Um, and uh, Dave, you, you had made an interesting point that, that you, you thought I used Zarine Stacker to put some of these together. And there's diff for people that haven't ever done focus stacking, um, you typically need specialized software where your camera's on a rail so that you can just turn a little dial and it moves it like a fraction closer towards the subject and back again. You don't actually focus using the, uh, the focusing ring on the lens. And uh, dedicated software, uh, Helicon Focus, Zarine Stacker, and all that sort of stuff, doesn't work when you're hand-holding the shots. Every one of these snowflakes is done without a tripod, uh, without a focus rail. It's all handheld. Because um, to get that angle that I need to adjust it by a fraction of a degree uh, requires uh, sort of freehand motion. And you have to sort of guess and just adjust on the fly until you find that perfect angle. It's not okay, the easiest thing to do. Done. Let me ask you a question. How do you know 
that the that which flake is going to be like a good flake. So, uh, well, I I have the the black bit note there, and I I, I guess. Snowflakes will fall on it, and something will just pique my interest. Maybe the center is a little bit larger. If it has a bigger center to, towards a snowflake, typically it's a bit more interesting because you know there might be some geometry in the center of that. Uh, I'll try to find another good one with uh, a geometric center. Um, that will that that'll allow you to. Uh, here's one. Uh, uh, Gino, I'll, I'll share this one. Um, if you if you can see an interesting center, then you you're pretty much guaranteed an interesting snowflake because uh, you know that there's going to be something cool happening within that. Uh, but how big so is small. how big is that though? Like when you uh, say a flake hits your mitt, can you literally with your own naked eye see like oh wow that's an interesting snowflake right there? To a degree, this one's about two millimeters in diameter, uh, so I could tell in this one, yeah, you know, if I'm looking closely enough, that there might be something interesting. I can't see these details, but I can at least see that it might be interesting. Uh, one, this seems to arm got cut off on the one side. Uh, yeah. No, it, well, it, it, it kind of grew that way actually. Uh, you can see that it's it, it sort of tapers off to a little, little point there, and uh, it, it's interesting. This is two snowflakes laid on top of each other. This is the same snowflake That's photographed from a different angle. Ridiculous. And and so you get a, a completely different feel uh, of the image. It almost looks a little bit tribal with the way that they uh, overlap, and you can't really see the way that they're separated. You know, um, I mean that you know you can market that to like tattoo artists and stuff, like these kind of like totally uh, original, you know, no snowflake is the same type of thing. That is yeah. legit. On one hand, I can't. I'm like totally in awe of you, and, and then like I think most photographers can really work. Yeah. And I absolutely hate you that you do this. <laughs> It's like, yeah, hey, 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 Brian, do you know who said, though, that the, no two snowflakes are the same? That was Miyagi. That's the dude that said that. So, like, I don't even believe that. Wrong, so. I, that, that dude, I don't believe anything that guy said. Hey, John. John. Yeah. Kamarechka, I want to ask you a question. Like, what got you into, like, focusing on snowflakes? Like, how many girls turned you down at the bar? Before you said, I'm, so, I'm going for snowflakes. That's my thing now. Like, what happened? Well, okay, so uh, it was just after Christmas, and I bought myself. Canon has a fairly specialized macro lens. It's a, they call it the MPE 65 millimeter lens. It gets far closer than any other uh, company's macro lenses can get. Um, a typical macro lens will get to one to one life size. We'll just use that as a metric. Uh, this lens gets five times closer than that, five to one. And so that gets me into the realm of being able to photograph snowflakes on a very, very small scale. Uh, I'll show you one more here that uh, gives you some, uh, you know, interesting right. colors. But, but I mean, like, where was it that you said this is what I'm I'm going to do this? So well, I, I, I'll tell you. I, I bought this lens just after Christmas, and I was working. How much a did it cost? The lens? How much does that lens cost? Fourteen hundred Canadian. Uh, you could probably get it close to a thousand in the U.S. Um, <laughs> It, uh, it, I use a ring flash with it as well, so that adds to the price. It's not a cheap thing to do, um, but I was working a boring desk job. I'm educated in advertising, so I was working at an ad agency at the time, and uh, I had my lunch break. I had this lens. It was snowing outside. Um, I, I had some homemade mittens from my grandma. Uh, I, I sent one outside to gather a few snowflakes and follow it up with a couple of shots, and, and that's how it started. Um, uh, less than a year later, I stopped uh, working at an ad agency and became a photographer full time. Bravo, man! That's, That's man. Can I ask a question? Those are really awesome interviews. Yeah, yeah. everyone loves them. But why don't you uh, like? Do you have to hold them, or why can't you put them in your grandmother's mitt and like lay them on the ground and then you? <laughs> no, no, use I'm not wearing the mitten. Uh, I'll, I'll make that distinction here. The mitten is lying down on uh, you know whether the sidearm of a barbecue or an old desk I have. Just you know, instead of throwing it out, I put it in the backyard just as a higher platform. Um, and it's funny because I've used a lot of different things as a, you know trying to find a better surface to photograph these snowflakes on. Um, but the mitten provides a nice dark background, you know, lots of contrast. Um, but the snowflake will get caught in the fibers, and it'll make like one or two contact points so that it doesn't melt. It's not like it's sitting flat against a surface and transferring heat. So in you know temperatures where it's right near the freezing point, the snowflakes won't melt very quickly. Uh, so they'll last a little bit longer for me to take the pictures. And uh, if you try to ever photograph them uh, or photograph anything on felt or say like the surface of a barbecue or what have you, uh, you'll get a lot of background texture detail coming in, especially when you focus stack. That's a nightmare to edit out. It's actually fairly easy to edit out those fibers of the mitten. It, it, it takes me maybe a half hour um, to, to mask them all out and get friendly with my clone tool. Uh, I actually but, do a lot of uh, photo photography on uh, barbecues. 
So me and you have that in common, I guess. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, the it, Texas it's Texas Canadian connection. Hey, there Don, what is the uh, website where people can come help fund your book? You didn't really. What? Where do they go? Right. So I, uh, I, I mentioned I'm doing a book on the snowflakes. It's going to be a 300-page book. It's going to be detailing all the science and the physics, and of course the photo, uh, you know, the photos, the photographic techniques, and all that fun stuff. Um, if you go to my website, the main banner across there has got a link right to it. Uh, so it's just doncom.ca. Uh, D O N K O M. Uh, it's on Indiegogo because uh, when I when I last checked, they weren't so friendly to a Canadian bank account. You have to have U.S. bank account and stuff to go on Kickstarter. Uh, uh, so Indiegogo was the the one to go for. And uh, as of right now, we're over seventy percent funded. And the book is like we're doing like a, an offset printed run, and those are not cheap to uh, to fund yourself. So the funding goal is fifteen thousand, and we are over eleven thousand. Actually, I just had a few contributions come in since we started. So uh, thank you very much to those listening that are adding awesome. to uh, adding to the pot. That's cool. Hey, uh, Holly is showing the screen here. So I, I, I want to ask a serious question. I know I let the group down when I ask serious questions, but. Um, that picture, I, I actually went earlier and I went on your Google Plus site. I looked at your pictures. That picture behind you, I'm looking yeah. at that and I'm saying, if you've got that hanging on the wall behind you, what other gems do you have? Because that's not on your Google Plus site. Uh, well, it hasn't been there for a while. Uh, I'll, I'll show you another interesting image here. Um, uh, last year, I did a couple of trips. One was to Bulgaria, which I took that image from. Uh, one was to the northern Yukon wilderness, where I spent three weeks with a group of hunters uh, traveling around the middle of nowhere uh, near, the, uh, Yukon, <laughs> near the Yukon uh, Northwest Territories border. So here's an image that, uh, that I had taken during that little adventure. And uh, oh. this is... Uh, this is a fish eye shot of the the northern lights dancing around uh, the North Star. Uh, it's a seven shot combined image. Uh, this is a uh, I think it's about a two hour time frame between the first shot and the last shot. I, I actually I tried to uh, to put them all in, and I I ended up with this, and I wasn't quite happy with this as a result because uh, it 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 it's overpowered like a or something. Well, yeah, that's just I guess the the scaling. Uh, if, if you were looking at the full res, then uh, it, it okay, wouldn't okay. Have that. Yeah. Uh, but I did, the stars overpowered the northern lights, and I didn't find it as a proper balance. So I, I threw right. seven frames together and uh, space them out based on a Fibonacci sequence so that they start closer together and they get further and further apart. If you see, like, the stars start closer and then they, they sort of spread out, they almost accelerate. Oh, hold on, uh, hold on. Uh, Don just said Fibonacci sequence. Everybody take a drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... So uh, I, I, this was one of the gems that uh, had, had come out of that trip. Uh, there, there was one more that I had taken from there. Uh, let's see if I could find it here. I like tons of snowflakes and all sorts of other stuff. Um, ah, this one. Ah, there we go. So this this was uh, after hiking up a mountain just at sunset, and uh, this is a an HDR panorama that I had put together. Uh, the mountains you see in the background is the border between the Yukon and, and the Northwest Territories, about halfway up. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is when you decide to hike up a mountain in the wilderness, you know, it's a good idea for about the first couple of steps, and then you realize that you're horribly out of shape, but you've committed to something that you can't back out on. <laughs> and uh, and then you get all the way to the top completely out of breath, and uh, might you know, your knees are killing you. You realize the sun has set at this point, uh, or, you know, it's, you know, seconds from setting. It gets dark pretty quickly after that, and uh, we have to make it back to the ATVs and then back to camp before it gets completely dark or else we can't find our way. And so it was a bit of a, a tricky moment to head back yeah. down from there. I had, I had a similar experience, except for I hiked down into the Grand Canyon, took some sunset shots, and realized I had an eight-hour trek up. <laughs> At least you could just go down, you know. Yeah, well, it's funny because about about a week before I had. And you uh, don't taken look like photograph. you weigh two hundred and forty pounds either, so you're not. You got nothing on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you. The funny thing is, about a week before I had uh, headed out to the Yukon, I, I did an, uh, sort of an adventure race photo shoot uh, up on the Blue Mountains near here. Just ski hills in the winter time, but in the summertime, they're like, uh, uh, you know, BMXs, and, and people will uh, do like uh, adventure races and things like that. So I was stuck at the top of this mountain. Uh, photographing this race for people going through this obstacle course in pouring rain. We had about, uh, I think they clocked it in at 60 millimeters of rain throughout the whole day, shooting for 10 hours, jumping all over the place. My knees were completely shot. I couldn't walk after that. 
and then going into the Yukon and climbing mountains the week after. Uh, I, I climbing up this mountain, I couldn't walk down. I, I I had to sort of fumble down the mountain on my uh, on my side. It was not fun. How old are you? How old are you? Like twenty six? Twenty six exactly. Yeah, you guys you just need to shut up. I'm forty eight. <laughs> Gino, what are you a carno carny worker or something? Yeah, I do. I make I, I make that pink stuff that people suck on. You know, whatever it is. You make things go click. Yes, I make it go click. <laughs> But anyway, my whole point was, Don, is you've got amazing photography that has nothing to do with snowflakes, and even though your snowflake stuff is incredible, I just don't, I don't like to see you get, like, pigeonholed as a snowflake guy, because your work is amazing in, in all the other kind of stuff that you take. Well, I, I really appreciate that. You know, I do a lot of fun water droplet stuff and macro stuff. I'm teaching a workshop at the Brooks Institute in, uh, in California at the end of this month. Oh, nice. And uh, I'm really excited for that. So I'll be down in Santa Barbara and uh, visiting folks down there as well. If, uh, if anybody uh, sees this and wants to hang out, just let me know. And, uh, when it, when is it? Uh, the workshop is April 26th, 27th, 28th, but I'll be there for a week bookending that. So. You should try to make it to the campus. No, oh, sure. Uh, at the very least, just to walk around and stuff, but we can do something more formal. Sounds great, Brian. We'll, uh, yeah. we'll be in touch. Grab yeah. a coffee. All right. Hey, Ollie. Oh. Um, we're, we're all going to share photos here in a second. We're going to see what everyone's been up to uh, photographically. Uh, but first, uh, tell us uh, what's going on with this um, social media documentary you're doing. It's uh, kind of the first of its kind, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, it's amazing that it's been almost a year since I interviewed Rut row. Oh no, <laughs> man! He does not the have. I've been, I've been internet here in New Zealand. He must have a bad. New Zealand. Well, you're using all the bandwidth. <laughs> you're using all the bandwidth, Trey. Right? <laughs> Was he oh, broadcasting from Canada? Oh, oh he's, he's back. back. He's back. He's there there I am. There he is. Sorry, Just say that again, Ollie. Ollie. We Cuts lost off. Him. No, that's right. Um, you're playing noises again. Um, I started off this documentary by going to Europe and I was photographing a wedding in the Lake District of uh, England and I thought while I'm there I had this idea to do this documentary I'd quite like to maybe just I don't know reach out and see if I can get to in touch with Philip Bloom who was someone I had sort of come across in my uh, trying to learn about DSLR video and things like that because I come from a stills background and um, I just sent him a tweet and another tweet and a couple of emails and all of a sudden I'm in his kitchen interviewing him about social media and then it's kind of grew from there where I just sort of took opportunities when I saw them um, and I went to NAB which is a broadcasting conference in Vegas um, in a couple of weeks time a year ago and I knew that there was going to be a whole bunch of people in one place who I wanted to talk to and I got to talk to uh, Vincent Laferre and the guys from Small HD. I bumped into a Kiwi um, director of photography who was born in the Taranaki region and then shifted to Hollywood and has been there ever since. So I've been able to get in touch with a whole bunch of people that I, I kind of looked out to and, um, and, and I've been able to just sort of sit down with them and chat and now I'm in the process of going through and trying to find a story through all of that so it's not just a whole bunch of talking heads which is really the the big learning process as a, as a young budding filmmaker that I've been going through. Um, how do you make a whole bunch of interviews interesting but hopefully I'm, I'm on the right track and I've probably got another month or so to go. Cool. Do you have a little uh, promo you want to show? Because uh, people want to want to see more, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Dave's going to play it for us. This came from the idea that there were some really cute little moments within the interviews that I had, and I wanted to put like an outros thing at the end. But I'm not so sure, as a first film of a of a young filmmaker, that anyone's actually ever going to make it to the end of the movie. So I figured I'd put the outros at the beginning and use that as a lead-in. Um, so what you're going to see is some of the little outtakes from from the interviews. Um, you won't know everyone who's mentioned in this because they're kind of people from my little sphere, um, a couple of Kiwis and a couple of randoms. But it's kind of a cute little sort of introduction to and I, and. What Trey said at the end really nailed it on the head because you kind of expect it to be something silly and then he sort of slaps you upside the head with this amazing comment about uh, social media. So, uh, you know, have a look. Uh, 
Uh, my name is, so we're rolling. Sorry, that was, that was so quick. I was like, wow. Okay, so do it again. And it went crazy. So I got asked by a whole lot of other people and, and for the last uh, two years, <laughs> I love Kiwis. <laughs> Please put that in your documentary. <laughs> So, um, but what was your question? <laughs> How do you handle the 33,000 followers? Mm. It's gonna get hot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was my Elvis quote of the day. <laughs> you know who Elvis was, right? <laughs> and, and am I looking at you here or looking? Yeah, so you're gonna be looking okay, at me. perfect. I'm sorry that I said Netherlands instead of New Zealand. That was such a faux pas. No, no, that's right. I'll cut that How out. embarrassing. <laughs> that's the stuff that happens, unfortunately. All right. I did that already, huh? Eh? <laughs> So, how is this weather thing? <laughs> I shouldn't be doing this. But I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> but it won't stop me. Who's this? Creepy guy who doesn't say anything. I'm not sure when it finally clicked that social media was the clear and evident future of us all. pretty uh, savvy of you to bookend it with Jeremy and Trey. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. So that's the thing. I mean, some, some of you will know some of those names, some of you won't. Um, but the whole story is about how each one of them has done it differently. They've all got different levels of followers, um, but they all seem to be making a real sort of serious effort with social media and it's really working for them and so that's kind of the bit that I want to get to the end and and tell everyone that you know for people who come up to me and say oh this social media thing is such a waste of time then they really need to see what these people are doing and how they're doing it and just how much of a difference it's really making to everyone you know I, I think you've really hit on something uh, very very real Ollie um, I've been thinking about this exact same thing for quite a while that there's this uh, cult of personality, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way to anybody that's achieved it, but that there's the, the internet and social media has opened up a whole, a whole avenue that was, just was not there before, and it is real, and uh, it, it, it has substance, and you know, it's the future, at least for now, and um, I, found a, a really funny, I think it's interesting um, what you're doing. Yeah, there's a really interesting sort of correlation. I, halfway through filming this, I listened to an audiobook of the Steve Jobs story, and it talks about how in the 70s he got in touch with one of the guys from Hewlett and Packard and asked for a part, and they sent it to him. And so there was this time pre-80s where you could pick up a phone book and get in touch with the CEO of a company because his name was there. And then the 80s and 90s happened, and it was just like so untouchable. And now it's come full circle again where I can pick up my phone, I land in Queenstown, pick up my phone and say, hey, Trey, you've never met me, but I'd like to do an interview. And literally six hours later, be in a cafe doing an interview with Trey Ratcliffe, who's got like millions of followers. So it's kind of broken down those barriers, and, and it's really interesting to see how – that's why when I started the doco, it wasn't about me. I didn't want it to be about me as a 
photographer or me as a person or anything. It was just about all these people, what they had to say. But actually, the more I've done it, the more my journey of how I've met these people has actually become so much a part of the story that the whole documentary is made off a few tweets to a few people. And, and that's really kind of the power of it. Where, where can we watch this documentary? It's it, When I've finished um, editing and doing all the things I need to do, it's going to be broadcast by all the people you see in the film because the documentary itself is probably going to be about 80 or 90 minutes long. Uh, that's going to be available to watch online for free. Um, but I've got so many hours of footage of people's interviews. Um, Trey talked for, I don't know, six days. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, he the whole interview with Trey and Jeremy Cowart was another one. Jeremy was one of those guys who I'd looked at from afar and just kind of almost idolized because he's, you know, he's shooting all this amazing stuff with amazing people I want to hang out with. And yet he was the nicest guy. And I was able to sit down at 10 p.m. in Santa Monica on a Saturday night. He made the trip in just for this interview for me. And um, what he has to say. row. More New Dollars for a problems. download. If you want to download one person's interview, then, you know, you pay two bucks and you can get the whole thing. Good business model. I, I get zero dollars out of that, by the way. But I'm happy a, for you. I'm right. happy for you, Ollie. Will there be a flat be version? Will there be a flat book version? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If yeah, Kate wants to transcribe it for me, then there will be a new site called Flat Docs. Yeah. Yeah, hey, actually, uh, what... I have a, a totally different kind of question. Who did those graphics for you at the end? I was really just going to cool. ask that. I yeah. wondered if you would ask that. That's um, that's a really interesting website called Elance, which you can put uh, up on on Elance. You know, I want a website. I want uh, graphics for a documentary. Blah blah blah. Um, and I, I put up a project that said I'm doing this documentary on social media. What have you got? And I got probably 25 people reply back with everything from 500 bucks up to 20 grand for doing me a short 30 second intro. But this one guy was from um, Romania, I think, and he's from a company called Fox in the Box. And he came back and said, here is my stuff. And I looked at what he'd done, and it was kind of flash, kind of looked like it was flash based, but it had all these really cool um, contours and effects. And I just said, you know, how much would it cost? And he said, five hundred bucks. Wow! So I was like, amazing! Sweet. What a deal! It's beautiful. So I'm hoping to get him to do more throughout the film itself. When I when I need to illustrate something that I haven't, because it's all self-funded, I haven't been able to shoot everything I wanted to. So I may have to illustrate some of that with animation. Yeah, I dig it. I no, dig I'll, it. Okay, I've got a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you you've interviewed uh, you know, quite a few people. How many people in total? Uh, there's 12 at the moment, but I want to do two more. One is a, a lady who lives in South Auckland down here. Um, Auckland's the biggest city of New Zealand, but it's still only got just over a million people in it, so it's not massive. But she lives on a fig plantation up in the hills, and she is a social media expert of sorts, and she travels around the world doing talks on social media. So I want to chat with a, a lady who's originally from the UK, now lives in my own backyard, and she's making a living out of social Social media by flying around the world, but she can, you know, grow figs as well. I find that's it fascinating. That's that's Karen Hutton. <laughs> Karen Hutton. No, is that an joke? No, Linda Coles is her name. Oh, Linda, I'm sorry, I thought I was confused. That for that for me is one of the one of the best things about social media, but also one of the scariest things about social media is that anybody can set up shop and say I'm a social media expert and a lot of brands I'm speaking to a lot of brands about how they use social media and how they interact with the public and they don't really get it yet they they see numbers they get romanced by numbers of followers but you know you guys are successful on social media you know it's not just about numbers you know you can monkey see monkey do you can get followers just by doing I follow you you follow me but that doesn't mean anyone's listening to you you can just be shouting into a vacuum as far as they're concerned so that's this I'd be interesting to hear what she's got to say about how she came about her expertise whilst being on a fig farm it's kind of one of those weird <laughs> She, um, well, would, she specializes in LinkedIn, I believe, so I, I haven't actually talked to anyone about LinkedIn specifically. It's mostly been sort of Google and Facebook and Twitter and things, but it's going to be interesting to get her take as well. 
Ali, you had mentioned that a lot of people find their own path towards having some level of, uh, of fame or high levels of interaction within the social media. And, and I'm really interested to see this documentary just to see how varied those are. Because, you know, dial it back five years and there were some very set paths that you had to walk down in order to get any level of fame. And there was a lot of luck and chance involved. Involved, where now it seems that it's you know a lot of your own personality comes through I'm sure a lot of the people that you interviewed like none of them I'm sure were rude or obnoxious or, or anything like that uh, you know off camera you know in their own personal space and yeah. it just the, the general goodwill of people will rise to the top I think that's exactly it and if Trey goes into that specifically in his um, interview but it's kind of that being genuine will get you followers because people can read you like a book when you throw everything open on the internet and it's the people who are genuine it's just interesting asking the question do you have a strategy for what you do and some people are so there is no way I could have a strategy that's just not me and other people are like without my strategy I wouldn't be where I am today so it's really interesting to hear the differences of opinion <laughs> Hey, uh, we'll move into the, the picture sharing part. We'll start with Thomas and see some of his new pictures. And then oh, we'll pictures. Go around. Sharing pictures. But, oh. um, right before that, there's a question that came in. And actually, this I've never addressed this, so I wanted to go and address it. This is this came in on uh, Google Moderator. This is from Aman in Seattle. He said, Trey, whatever happened to your planned trip to Nepal, or I think it was Nepal, with Patrick Rothfuss? And in case you guys don't know or don't remember, uh, Patrick Rothfuss is like one of my favorite authors, and I, if you guys read his his books, uh, you will level up as my friend. The name of the wind. You can start with that one. Uh, fabulous. Anyway, so uh, we kind of got to be friends through, through the internet, and kind of the way uh, you know uh, I got to be friends with Ollie and a lot of a lot of people. He was sort of always this untouchable um, god to me. You know, when you really admire an author, really admire someone, you think, oh, I'll never. I'll never actually end up getting to know this person, but then sometimes you do. Uh, so anyway, it turns out that he does this charity event called World Builders, and I, I offered to help him out. And um, it was agreed that if we could reach um, half a million dollars, and if we could raise five hundred thousand dollars, that he and I were going to go to Nepal together to see the charity in action. And I would take photos, and we would hang out and be nerds and geeks and stuff. Uh, but this year we only reached four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We did not get to half a million, and I said, "Oh, we should go do it anyway, you know, because we can still show the charity what they do." He's like, "Well," you, and he has a good point. Well, you can't you can't give it to people anyway. It was the reward. So maybe any, next year we might hit half a million dollars, and we'll do it. We'll do it the next year. And anyway, thanks again for everyone that uh, donated to that charity, and we'll we'll uh, we'll do it again next year. I never really gave an update on that, so there's. There's that update. Okay, Thomas Hawk, share like the wind. All right. Now next year, do you have to start over at zero again and get another five hundred, or can you just get the fifty extra? <laughs> no, we got to start at zero again. It's no problem. We can do it. We can do it. All right. Yeah. We can do it. All right. So I'm going to share a few photos. Um, let's see here. Uh, screen share. Okay, so I was in Idaho last week, uh, and here we go. Fish eye. Yeah, these are some photos from Idaho. So this first one was uh, I went to this amazing house. This uh, this architect Susan Desco, who is a protege of Frank Gehry, uh, started this house. This guy, uh, this multi-millionaire technology guy. Uh, started building this massive house, as you can see, uh, put about $4 million into it, and then ran out of money and, and had to stop. And it was foreclosed and sold and all of this. So this is this amazing house that's uh, half finished, sitting out in the sort of middle of Idaho. And uh, the architect, Susan Desco, we went down there and we looked at it with her and uh, my good new friend, uh, Scott Jordan, who's uh, a founder of this company called Scotty Best. Uh, was going to oh, buy nice. this house, and so uh, Scott took us down there, and we, we, I mean, it was like a field day. I just, I mean, I love sort of abandoned places, and this isn't quite abandoned, but the, the to have a Geary-inspired sort of halfway built home and have free roam of it was just great. Isn't everything in Idaho in the middle of Idaho? It is. <laughs> yeah, right. So, but I mean, this this home, this home is like. The steam pump, steam pump home that Trey would build, I think. 
I mean, it had a fish tank, a shark tank. It had all kinds of crazy stuff in it. Looks like the whole place is made out of wagon wheels. Yeah, it's wood and stairs and lines. and. But I love Frank Geary. And um, anyways, so we went there. Who doesn't? Uh, I got up on top of the mountain. Uh, we were in Sun Valley for this conference, uh, the Dent Conference. And uh, I got up early at sunrise one morning at the very top of Sun Valley and got to shoot some snow-covered mountains. Uh, this, these are some logs that cover the Starbucks. So Susan Desco, the previous architect, was also the architect. So I love just sort of the texture out there, the logs. And what do you, what, I didn't get that. What do you mean it's covering Starbucks? Well, there's a Starbucks there, and apparently that was quite controversial when Starbucks came to Sun Valley, Idaho, because, you know, it's like this little town, and this is Starbucks. There's a Starbucks in Idaho? There is, yeah. Oh, there's many, oh. many. But there's one in Sun Valley, and so they, they tried to make it a very cool Starbucks. And mm. so the exterior, the outside, the outside walls, it all looks like all these stacked logs. It's a sort of hidden Starbucks. I heard that Starbucks is going to start opening up new Starbucks in the bathrooms of Starbucks. Right. At Walmart. At Walmart. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I went and visited Ernest Hemingway's grave, which is wonderful because it's always got these alcohol bottles on there, and it was snow, so I had to clean the snow off his grave and all of that. That was cool. He killed himself in, in Idaho there. There were some train train tracks. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. But, uh, I don't know. You know, I don't. Who's the one with a gun? Uh, so uh, this this old this old train tracks and trees and stark. It's winter. The clouds in Idaho. The clouds are like no place else I've ever been. It's just they're amazing. They're they're you know even better than Texas clouds. They're just wonderful. Blasphemy. Uh, I know, right? Uh, I went down to Twin Falls and took this picture of this bridge. I think it's the highest suspension bridge in the world over the Snake River. Down in Twin hey, Falls. Evil Knievel tried to jump over the Snake River, so how cool is yeah, that? He did. Yeah, There's a plaque. Too. There's a plaque for Evil Knievel there, right at this right at this bridge. Here's to you, Evil. <laughs> we miss him. Uh, I went to the Capitol building in Idaho, which is uh, you know the Capitol. Boise is the capital of Idaho, so I went in there. Um, and then my last day in Idaho, I hung out in Boise with a couple of uh, good friends, uh, with Alex Cooey, and uh, he introduced me to uh, Dylan Howell and Sarah Byrne, uh, and Matt Lightholt. I think that I say his last name right. I may have gotten it wrong, but we all hung out in Boise. And uh, we went and shot this prison. And so here's Sarah. She's a wonderful photographer and also a great model. And so she kind of modeled for us. <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh, she's not a real prisoner. No. She, well, she was, oh. she was actually, Matt was shooting her from inside this uh, prison cell. And I went outside and was shooting through the bars. And I liked her expression. Oh. All right. I thought you were like you went to a women's prison in Maricopa County, and you're like, and she's a great model and serving 50. Uh, <laughs> and she's serving time. Yeah, yeah. 20 years from now, she'll be on probation, but, man, yeah, she's right. a heck of a model. No, I, I, think, I, mean, I think Thomas was just taking a photo of his TV screen at 3 a.m. in his uh, hotel room with Scoble, like Cinemax. <laughs> right, right, yeah. the women's prison movie. Yeah. So, this is Jody Arias' uh, cellmate. Right, and this here's another picture of Sarah. The light in prison is just great. I mean, you have the best light. In prison. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was, it was the best light I've seen in a long time. You know, you have this like streaming in sunlight coming in, and it was just you know, it almost made me want to spend time there. Not really, but um, you know, you know, actually. Actually, I think that's in Trey's new tutorial. Uh, that's one of his tips. If you want really great lighting, go to a women's prison. <laughs> yes, yes, a women's prison. So yeah. So anyways, yeah, I kind of, I kind of shot a women's prison. They did have a women's, the w women's cell there too, which was pretty cool. But uh, Sarah and Dylan just got married two weeks ago. They're making some sort of a movie or documentary about them, I think, or something like that. Yeah, that marriage is doomed. But whatever. No, they're very. They're said the coolest people, Gino. You'd love them. Sure, they got married in a women's prison, so of no, course No, 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 no. We were just hanging out in the prison two weeks after oh. they got Apparently they got all these people to shoot their wedding. There's some sort of documentary they're doing on it. But they they do a lot of weddings and engagement and a couple type stuff, but they're 
great photographers, and it was just all serendipitously. You know, I I, I was uh, up there. I had arranged to meet up with Matt, but then I was having dinner the night before, uh, and Alex just tweeted me and said, "Hey, let's hang out." And Dylan and Sarah showed up, and we all had the best time. Next thing you know, you're in a women's prison. <laughs> With very good light, Gino. With very, very good yes. light. Yes. Well, that's standard. That's so, anyways, that's that's what I was up to last week. So there you Excellent. go. Excellent. The visual diary. Mm. All right. Cool. Um, we'll kind of go around. I'll go last. I, I don't like to share first. I'll share last. Kate, do you have anything to share? Or should we move on? Um, I can share. I don't know how how impressed you're going to be, but I'll, go, I'll do a very quick share. Um, uh, full screen, start screen share. Um, my launch party, my nephew wasn't impressed with the party but rather liked the book which was quite nice. <laughs> my dad, the proudest dad in the world, check that grin out. I thought that was kind of kind of cute. Um, that's me taking a picture of me being drawn by an artist at Teach Meet. So meta. Mm -hmm. I know, isn't it? Isn't it? I, I tagged myself afterwards as well. Which is <laughs> a little bit obscene. That's me being a zombie for a video game with my colleague LJ Rich, which was. Is that for fun. real? Yeah, yeah. We we took part in a, a video game filming, so we we were crowdsourced zombies. Awesome. Which was kind of fun, um, and and I have cats, so these are my hey, cat hey. cat. Cat pictures. That's Captain Jack, who's very cute and quite shy. That's Tia, who's an absolute princess and very glamorous. And finally, this is oh no, that's the J breakfast of champions that I'm going to be having in about um, an hour from now when this is over. Yum. All right. Uh, Kate, quick, a couple of bars of someone like you. Say again. Whoa. Uh, just a couple Never of mind. verses of so Never mind. Never mind. He wants you to sing. He wants you to sing. <laughs> I'm convinced that you can sing like Adele. I know it. <laughs> there is actually some video which I'll share with you later online of me doing a karaoke app on BBC Click, and you will uh, know quite quickly that I, I can't sing anything like Adele. <laughs> I love that you put a W in the word karaoke. Karaoke. Fucking cheap. Hey, uh, Ollie, it looks like you have a plus one there. Yeah, this is number three. He um, has got sick of being locked out of Dad's office and has pushed his way in. Hi. High five. He's number three. How, how, many, how many do you have, Ollie? You have three? No, this, this, is, this is the last one. This is number three, Nathan. And we've got uh, Josh and Alia. They're all under six, more. though. So it's, do, do one more. You can, you're good well, for one. Maybe we will. Maybe we will. Eight the great. I hate the great. I'm one of five, and five is cool. Um, I'll just share very quickly, Trey, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, uh, quickly, quickly. Do, um, uh, Gino, then Brian. All right. Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm a corporate photographer mostly. Um, corporate companies tend to pay the bills much better than families and weddings and things. So I've kind of fallen into that into that role. And the the problem with corporate photography is that it doesn't always turn out very exciting. Um, but one of my best clients is the Auckland Airport, and they recently had to clean up the uh, foreshore around where the airport is in Auckland, and so they've got this hovercraft, and they promised us a trip in a hovercraft if we came to help clean up. Um, so while that's not such a very exciting thing, um, I do get the opportunity to get some shots that other people wouldn't. So I'm in a field lost, and I've got this great big sort of aircraft uh, antenna thing, radar, um, and I I was able to get to parts of the airport that a lot of people aren't able to get to, so I was able to get some pretty cool um, sorts of shots. Um, and then, oh, this one is one of my favorites. It's the Emirates A380, which is taking off. And um, I was just able to capture it just as it lifted off. Everyone sort of stopped what they were doing to watch this thing take off because we don't get very big planes here with little country. It's almost um, unbelievable when you see those things take off because it's oh, like, oh, yeah. that thing's never going to lift. It's never going to lift. It's going way too slow. And it's like, how the hell is that going in the air right now? It, that's not possible. That was yeah, one of the exactly. most enjoyable parts of the entire my Australia trip, basically, was that A380 that we took. It's just, it's like a flying hotel. Yeah, it was trundling down this runway. I was like, oh my goodness, it's not going fast enough. And then it just picked its nose 
was off and took off. It was crazy. It's actually a surprisingly smooth takeoff. Like, you, you, I was in, on the plane, I'm like, is this going to actually make it? It's just like, whoosh. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Um, <laughs> another job I had for the airport was these guys have developed this special grass that uh, has some kind of microbe in it or fungus or something that keeps bugs away, and therefore if there's no bugs, there's no birds. And they had a whole bunch of scientists come down to check out this grass that they've sown for the last year or so at the Auckland airport to see if whether or not they might be able to sell it around the world to every airport in the world, which is quite a big thing for New Zealand. But I had two minutes to get a photo for a press release. Um, this is what it had looked like moments before, a whole bunch of <clears throat> very not-so-interesting people standing around. But I was able to really quickly try and get a shot. Unfortunately, there were no planes landing in that two minutes, which would have really made the shot. But um, that's a lot of fun. Hawaiian Airlines have just recently started flying into Auckland. So you can fly Auckland Honolulu um, direct, which is pretty cool. And they, when they came down on their inaugural flight, they had this this uh, water arch, which welcomes the plane. Then they had a, a Maori welcome. And this is the CEO of, uh, of Hawaiian Airlines receiving or doing his part in, in the welcome, receiving the challenge. Um, but as part of that job, they wanted photographs of our sky tower uh, lit up in Hawaiian Airlines colors. So I got paid very handsomely to drive around my own city photographing it from various angles. And I just wanted to kind of share these just mainly because it's a pretty city at night. And uh, if you haven't been to Auckland, you believe well should. <laughs> you know, that shot you took of the two guys at the airport with the sun behind us, actually a pretty nice little shot there because you had the sun shining straight into your camera and you still have them well lit in front. You yeah, know, I had, um, sorry, go. I, I have to say, I live near the Oakland airport and these are some of the best pictures <laughs> I've ever seen. Now, hmm. Oakland, Auckland. Oh. Oh, oh this is Auckland. I, I thought you were saying <laughs> Oakland airport. Yeah. Actually, there's a story of a guy who got on a plane and wanted to go to Oakland, California and ended up in Auckland, New Zealand or something. Maybe it's the other way around. Uh, well, that's probably because he was doing some of that special grass. You know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, come and see us in New Zealand. That's me. There cool. you have it. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, he All must right, have so that one picture you have of Farah, too, that you took for the Auckland Airport. That was a good one. Where they're up at the. You took a chopper off them. Farah Fawcett Matrix? Right. No, another yeah, that was Indonesian Farah Fawcett. Oh, I'll see if right. I can find that. Yeah, she's a famous uh, chef. Uh, okay, Brian, share, oh. like the wind. Yeah, sure. Um, let's get screen share. Okay. So, what is Dino doing down there? <laughs> I was looking for something. I, dro I dropped something. Oh, I thought his you were going with a little his gun on Jeremy there. No, no. <laughs> so... I kind of actually want to stop sharing so I can see what Gino's doing because it's mm, what you no, want no. Um, You don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think he was tagging himself. <laughs> yes, with with his off camera right hand. Um, so I think when Nicole was my wife Nicole was on the last time, she shared some of her images from Australia, and I wanted to kind of do the same since uh, that was kind of the last major kind of thing in, in our lives and so uh, we, we were sent over there by the various boards of tourism for like Victoria and South Australia and Tasmania and it, it was really fantastic just kind of the, the fact that we were able to go and experience uh, that country from very much you know uh, intended kind of an, an American photographer's eyes uh, so this kind of you know rings true to my sensibilities of what I love to photograph more than anything. This is in Melbourne. Uh, they have these uh, laneways. I mean, we call them alleyways, but they refer to them as laneways. And they're just some of the most wonderful and ornate kind of... Uh, unfortunately, this wouldn't make it on Stocksy. Apparently, this can be considered intellectual property, which is a bummer. But it is beautiful to photograph. You see these like, really kind of characteristic... Um, just And it's almost... I think it's encouraged... And the other thing that I was told was that, like, in some of these laneways that you walk by, you, you'll find some of the coolest stores that you would never expect or restaurants that you wouldn't expect to be there. So I thought that was very cool. Um, this is another laneway. I was uh, uh, Borrowlands was really kind, and they let me uh, uh, 
play with uh, one of the Sony RX-1s uh, for the trip, and so a few of the days when it was just ridiculously hot out, uh, instead of carrying all my gear, I just walked around and tried to play around with some of the uh, capabilities of that camera. Now, is that some on-one software effects there? This is actually, yeah, this was, this is perfect black and white um, conversion, so I, I appreciate that, Gino. Well, it, it actually kind of looked like it. It's very nice. Oh, thank you. Um, and then I, I kind of, you know, Trey, there was a shot. It's not anywhere near kind of shot, but it, it, when I saw this, it reminded me of a shot you took uh, of a girl on a beach. Um, that yeah, except for his girl was 80 years old. No, like, not the old one. Chinese lady with the waves coming in. Not that shot. No, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, you could just ah. go go to his website. You'll see. It's it's a it's a pretty awesome shot. And I I didn't know that Nicole was a fisherman. She you know uh, uh, she, she I'll I'll extend that that compliment. Um, but oh, that, yeah, that's Mark, a fishing pole. Yeah, yeah quite a, a rod, rod she's got there. It is. <laughs> it's quite a rod. Um, and uh, th there was just a group of like four uh, four kids that were just kind of hanging out. This is a H Hamilton Point um, along the Great Ocean Road, and uh, so we were kind of we spent two days driving around this area. And uh, the other side was nearly as interesting as these. I would try to time it for these guys to come out and do like a. I was just happy that her, her body, for the most part, was standing still, and the fishing pole caught some of the wind, so gave it a nice dynamic look. But Typical, very, you know, I, I know Australians do love their beaches. Um, so, and then this is actually, if you if you were to, from where I was standing here, if you were to make an about face, this is what I was shooting there. And after a few shots, kind of gets boring. So it's like, all right, you know, much, much. Yeah, uh, that that cool. Fisher girl makes it go click. It, <laughs> it does go click. Um, yeah. So just kind of typical. Uh, there was no shortage of this kind of stuff uh, on the coast, which is fantastic. And then we went to the Cape Otway Lighthouse, also against uh, the Great Ocean Road. Um, this is also kind of what you, know, you mentioned about shooting against into the light uh, or into the sun, is just finding kind of like a cool... Um, if you can find something to block the sun, you get a really cool effect. And mm -hmm. uh, this was a... I put a 10-stop gel on the back of uh, the 14-millimeter cannon that I, uh, lens that I was shooting with, so... Just fun stuff here, and then uh, of course, no trip to the Great Ocean Road would be complete without the apostles. Uh, the coolest part about this was this was like literally the last thing we were doing before we went back to Melbourne and then fly back to the U.S. But we got in the helicopter. Uh, I think Nicole showed a shot from there. I can't remember, but very cool to see this um, at, at sunrise. You know, the little kiss of sun, uh, and then. Just kind of my last week in the Pacific Northwest, I'll be driving back down to uh, kind of the Bay Area for good. Uh, on Saturday, we went to a, a waterfall. Or, yeah, there was a, what was it called? Steep Creek uh, Falls. And so kind of my homage to the Pacific Northwest before uh, I, I go to the Silicon Valley and the cold, cold uh, hand of technology. Mm. Nice. nice photos. Uh, now nice. that you're bought and paid for Oh, you know, through and through. A kept man. The Kool-Aid is so delicious. Wow. I love it. Nice yes. reference. Thank you. Guyana. There's the photo. Uh, you know, I love you, man. <laughs> look at that. A great photo. Yeah, look at that. That is all. Look at that. It's like God rays just... <laughs> yeah, that's actually a really interesting effect that happens if you have a 17 mil tilt shift uh, as your only wide-angle lens that day. And uh, because of the bulbous uh, end of that tilt shift, it just makes these amazing um, sort of rays of light. And it just so happened that it came down on her. So it's a winner. That's another girl in your documentary, right? Yeah. That's right. She's in there as well, yeah. Yeah, so, much more reason to watch it than me. Okay. Yeah. I will right. share now. So, ready. so am I up? I haven't shared yet. Oh, yes, Gino, go. Yeah, okay. I, I, have, I have some I uh, you. flakes. I don't know how. I don't know how either, but like Don, the like the wind. Since since Don was uh, on tonight with the flakes, I thought I'd share some pictures I've taken of flakes. And um, oh. this, yeah, this this is a shot I took of Kim Jong Un. I, I went over to Kim uh, to China to take a picture of Kim Jong Un just because of this show. 
And the reason I took the shot, Trey, uh, was actually in honor of you because I thought, who's giving this guy haircut tips? Was it Vaco from Chronicles of Riddick? <laughs> Vaco? Where'd you pull that name out of? I mean, look at this haircut. It's the same haircut. So, anyway, uh, side note. So, uh, on my way over to China to get that shot for this show, I, I had to go through LAX. Why was Kim Jong Il in China? He goes there a lot. You'd be surprised that guy because he was he goes, Dennis he goes Rodman. For the food. He does. He's. I know a lot of people associate him with you know South Korea, but he's really a China guy. But uh, <coughs> don't even, don't worry about Trey. Don't worry about the facts, baby. I, you know I play fast and loose with the facts. But um, so anyway, I, I so when I was going through LAX to, in order to get to to Kim Jong Il, I ran into this flake, and I took a shot real quick, and uh, just for the show. But um, kind, kind of taking that? it serious. Who was uh, that? That Charlie Sheen. Yeah, that's Charlie Sheen. The drugs have taken effect. <laughs> he's not. He's not doing well. But I uh, here's a real flake. Hugh Grant, the CEO of Monsanto. That that man's a flake, and I'm not even kidding. But um, so uh, here's a. Well, I don't know how this got in there. Who's that? Oh, Wilson. <laughs> is that no? I think is that Billy Corrigan or is that Ann Murray? I don't know who that is. But. Yeah, uh, I love Billy. Yeah, yeah. I'm not really sure who that was, but anyway, um, I, I just wanted to share a few uh, shots of uh, some flakes that I took in honor of Don uh, Kamarechka. Amazing detail captured there. Uh, I'm here. For you. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, if anybody on this show, if we if we actually polled the audience and and said who's most likely to end up an evil genius, wouldn't it be Don Kamarechka? I got the based name, on, I guess. You know, it's it's yeah, kind of based like based on yeah. your performance. I I feel like you you kind of have that evil genius ability. Nobody really? else here well, can. I would say I, Kate I, Russell. I would say Kate Russell. It's close. I got to admit, it's close. In the next Bond movie, it might be Kate Russell as the evil genius. <laughs> <laughs> and she could sing. She could do her own like Bond song. Yeah, she could do the opening too. That'd be great. Yep, yep. You guys probably saw that picture of Kate Russell in Ibiza that um, that Dave yeah. was sharing yeah. earlier. Oh, I did. I thought that was <laughs> yeah. She's yeah. kind of cross-legged walking down the beach. Yeah, we we'll spent some time <laughs> together there. Just keep Although, you know, I, I did do something uh, crazy. I saw a few people showing off uh, helicopter shots uh, earlier. This is one that I had taken last uh, last summer sometime in uh, oh, over top of downtown Toronto at the harbor like front. rendering, too. <laughs> this this one, uh, this was tricky to take because it's with a fisheye lens out of a helicopter, so you have to lean out quite a ways before the helicopter uh, right. gets outside of the frame. So that's a bit scary to do that. It's a bit crazy. How do you get a fish up that high without it dying? That's ridiculous. You know yeah, what? Forget you know, about right that. over the water, <laughs> right? So it's. Uh, I want to know how you managed to get your watermark in the shot. I mean, what kind of? <laughs> that's crazy. That's skill it right out on there, a banner. Brother. You know, it's uh, it's really quite fun. Uh, you you know, got John, it's a guy on a jet ski down fish. the bottom, just spinning around. Yeah, the guy can shoot yeah, snowflakes. He can. Yeah, come on. <laughs> All right. I do, you know, I do not like watermarks. I hate watermarks. Yeah. If if I had I unwatermarked versions, I would show them off. These were sized for my iPad, so they're all watermarked on there. Um, oh. And and I try to make them unobtrusive, but uh, in this case, it's sort of it's kind of buggy. Uh, you know what? It doesn't even matter. Stocksy's going to accept you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. I'll share these real quick. Um, this is... Uh, there's this golf course here. I've mentioned it a few times. It's called The Hills. It's in between Queenstown and Arrowtown, and they have these sculptures um, on various holes. And these, this is their newest set of sculptures. They just got these huge Clydesdale stone horses. And I noticed, actually... I think people rarely read my descriptions because I always say that they're statues and then I read the comments and half the people go like, oh my gosh, the, they almost look like statues. <laughs> so I don't know why I bother writing descriptions anymore. So anyway, yeah. that's, I took that about uh, three days ago. I can't believe you got that horse to sit so still for that shot. <laughs> really impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, here, let me turn off my uh, uh, little info panel there. Okay, here we go. 
Um, here's another statue. This is actually Gino modeled for this one. He <laughs> came to New Zealand and just he's keeping it real out on the lake. Sure. Yeah, that's actually proportionally correct. Too, you can see there's nothing showing. <laughs> Uh, here's here's the fourteenth hole. Um, I play very late, and I'm always by myself. I never see anyone else out there. Do you so actually I, golf? Do you golf, Trey? Yeah, I golf. What kind of handicap? I mean, roughly. It's not good. I mean, it's not I'm good. That's what I thought. I'm sort of a, a mid mid nineties kind of shooter. But On the I front take a long nine? time because I take my camera around with me and set it up and take photos and I listen hmm. to music and I'm very much in my own world. Uh, so that's the fourteenth hole there. Um, I have a few Easter shots. There's my youngest daughter, Scarlett. I'm mm -hmm. counting her eggs. I usually don't take out my 40 to 24 lens. I mean, I'm sorry, my uh, uh, 70 to 200. 300. Uh, but I do for these these kind of things. Um, here's a photo of uh, Tom Anderson, our very own Tom in uh, in Australia. I'm about to go visit him. I think late. Next week, we're going to go spend a while in Japan before uh, then I'll come out and uh, I'll come out your way, Brian, to to uh, Northern California for a week or so. Bring it on. Um, here's uh, here's another photo. This is in, in Paris. This is the Museum of Evolution, one of the most awesome places in Paris that hardly anyone ever goes to. But they should, especially if you're into photography, because the lighting there is crazy. Yeah, but every, when you go to Paris, everybody goes to the Museum of Creation. I mean, that museum right there. Who goes there? <laughs> yeah, it was just me and Dawkins running around there. Yes. You know, there's a creation museum out in the California desert with, like, these big dinosaurs. Oh, I've heard about that. Yeah, there's That's dinosaurs cool. that kids can ride on and stuff. The They're not dinosaurs, Thomas. They're called Jesus horses. <laughs> 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 uh, here is uh, here's a shot of Sydney. This is actually the last shot I got before I broke my 14 to 24, which is now broken again. And I'm very worried because I just sent it over here to Australia to Sydney to get fixed, and they can't find it. So I think it got lost in the mail. I, wow! I don't know what to do. You, you, you've sense. had some bad fortune with that 14 to 24. Yeah, that thing has got some bad mojo on. I don't know what to mm -hmm. do. Uh, here's a shot from uh, Pinterest. This is from the Pinterest headquarters. And uh, I thought she had just a sort of nice hair. I always like it how uh, girls can have long hair, just kind of like do nothing, and I think it looks nice. I don't know so who she is. She's is a, girls a person of Pinterest. So it's not only all girls that use it, it's all girls that work there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This is um, taken at Burning Man. This was actually taken with a, a medium format camera, a phase one. Oh, wow. Was that the red? No, no, this is a phase one camera, uh, which I actually didn't feel like I used that well, but it was interesting to use. It was so weird. I'm not really much of a medium format kind of guy, but I I did enjoy the, the camera. What's up, the what's up with the red? You got the red. There was so much hype about you getting, and then I, I, don't, I don't hardly hear anything about it since then. Yes, I'm playing with it. I haven't published much with it. I'm just goofing around. What was the uh, the back that you used? Uh, the, what phase one camera was that? Oh, I don't know. Don't ask me these questions. <laughs> Trey has <laughs> so many. He can't remember the names no, of not, all the it cameras. Wasn't my camera. it wasn't my camera. Uh, here, two more to share. This is uh, this is from uh, Death Valley. This is uh, the desert what there. Is, I know. What is that little thing in the background there? What looks like thing? a looks like a caboose or something in the middle of the it's desert. A little, a little Humboid. It's a little yeah. bush. Little bush. Is that, uh, is that the mesquitoons or is that the uh, eureka? And this last one is in honor of Kate. This is a shot of uh, London. Oh yes. Which London station night. is that? Oh, it, it's the one by my hotel. <laughs> station, <laughs> station thirteen. Just make something up, Trish. Yeah. It looks like Charing Cross, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, Charing Cross. That sounds, that sounds about right. That's right, what as long I was as I'm thinking. here, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll do my share for the um, uh, for the, uh, the Google Plus discovery. discovery. All right, this guy is cool. Wait, you guys may already know him, but if you don't, you got to circle this dude up. I've just only recently discovered him, and it's only because of this one shot. I'm only going to show you one shot. That's all I need to show you. 
he'll know. Look at this thing. He shot wow. this in uh, Dubai. And it's one of those, I love these shots where you can't tell what's going on. You got to look at it for a while to figure out what's happening. Mm -hmm. But man, that is cool. Like, I, I really want to go to Dubai so bad. I see so many cool shots of this place. That's you know, incredible. if you're staring at that picture and you tilt over backwards into a tub, you wake up. <laughs> okay, I will unscreen share. So that's my find. His name is uh, Bino Saradzik. Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get it plus mentioned so you can you can follow him in the show notes when we repost this later. Okay, so let's go, um, uh, Thomas, and then we'll just go all the way to the left to Brian. All right. So uh, screen share. Hold on here. Uh... There it is. Uh, screen share. So my find is my good friend Suzanne Haggerty. Oh, good. Who awesome. Is here. And Suzanne, uh, one of the things I like about Suzanne is I've been watching her work for a while, and um, it's gotten gotten better and better very quickly. And particularly her processing skills, I've noticed. She's just, um, you know, she does a lot at the, by the beach where she lives. And um, I think the processing is just exquisite. You know, and the more she's doing with blur, I mean, I love blur. Uh, she's got some shots. I mean, she's got some, you know, some very dramatic stuff, you know, like this. But it's sort of Southern California beach life. But lately the stuff I've really enjoyed is some of this, like, blur stuff she's got going on. You know, like this. I like sort of like a, a little bit of an abstract element to some of it. Um, we hung out in the desert. Here she took a picture of me sleeping in the desert. But uh, Oh, yeah, I remember that shot. Yeah, we hung out there in Phoenix. Um, but, uh, you know, she's, she's a great photographer and a great uh, Google Plus community person and someone that's been very, very involved and in hanging out and does wonderful work of the California coast and all kinds of other stuff. So anyways, uh, that's Suzanne Haggerty, and she's on Google+, Plus and you can catch her there. Really cool. Good one. Okay. Ollie. Yeah. Um, I went on to um, Google+, Plus and just went into the uh, Google Photographers, um, and... I found this guy called Joe Uabe. Um, it, it sounds like working at Guangzhou, he might be in China or I don't know, not quite sure where they are. But um, I, I really enjoy images that kind of just, like you say, are different and make you, don't they don't answer all the questions, they ask a lot of stuff. Um, and stuff like this where he's just sort of taken a photo of something in, in life but just made it so artistic and beautiful. and. Um, and there's another one of the flowers there. And there's this great one here of this bird. The, the timing of this shot is insane. <laughs> I saw that was shared. That went fantastic. viral last week, didn't it? That's beautiful. Um, so, I mean, and just some of the stuff he's got here, this shot of the dog too is just is beautiful. Um, you know, just sort of grabs you and holds you and makes you want to stay there. So big ups to Joe Wabi. Cool. All right. Okay. I'm up. So um, I'm actually going to share a guy who I interviewed for my book. Uh, his name is Seth Castile, and um, he his business went just crazy mad on um, social media about uh, in the beginning of 2011. He spent his last thousand dollars on some underwater photography equipment, and then just started throwing his dogs into the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> and took this crazy series of shots which just uh, they they hit reddit everyone went crazy for them and suddenly his sort of you know website traffic went from 0 to 100,000 hits a day and he's just released a book so it's called underwater dogs and his um, business is called uh, little little friends uh, i think it's called little friends photos or something but he's Seth Castile on um, Google plus he's not been that active on Google plus i i persuaded him to uh, to join up, he's more a Facebook man, so we're, we're trying to re-educate him. We have to fix legend. that. Exactly, but I mean, how cool are these dogs, though? Right? I mean, he he says that he likes, he thinks 
that it really expresses their personalities, you know, the crazy part of them when they get in the water. The water just kind of like makes them still enough for him to capture that. So. Yeah, it reminds me of a series of pictures I took, only I titled it Girls I've Dated. <laughs> ah, there's one other, look, how, how cool are these though as well? This is, uh, this is like uh, Elena Callis, her name is. I oh, love yeah. underwater oh, yeah. stuff. And she does all of these um, really cool sort of like sci-fi fantasy photographs underwater. And she's definitely worth looking at as well. She's done a whole series of Alice in Wonderland mm -hmm. shots, which are just mm -hmm. stunning. I love the play of the water and the hair and the materials and the reflections and stuff. Yeah, she's great. She is another good one. Very cool. So they're my picks. Hey, Gino, your, your turn for water sports. Oh, yes. Um, well, you know, the uh, person I wanted to highlight was Julia Peterson. I don't think Mrs. Mrs. Peterson gets nearly enough credit for... Uh, it's because she's in the shadow of the mighty, mighty Thomas Hawk. But uh, Julia is an amazing photographer. And uh, whenever I'm uh, kind of tired and I just want to cruise through and look at some good images. I have a whole little little circle of people that I always know are going to have good images that I'm going to enjoy, some good eye candy, and Julia is definitely one of them. So Julia, here's to you. I steal all her best shots. I know you do. <clears throat> all right, Don, your discovery, go. All right, uh, well, I I love macro photography. I love uh, you know the close up stuff. And there's a lot of photographers that I follow uh, within that regard. But uh, there's one guy that uh, uh, I've known for a little while. He has fairly few followers, less than two thousand, and he does a lot of really cool bug stuff. So here's a picture of an ant face close up. All sorts of really crazy stuff. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but the detail captured on this scale of things is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, this is Seth Burgess. And uh, and he's he's got all sorts of different bug pictures in his stream, and uh, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the work that uh, that he does. Now, and he, I, I know how difficult it is to do. So is, is he using that same crazy macro lens that you are? He's not. He's got a different set of equipment, awesome. um, using close-up filters and extension tubes and all sorts of other stuff. Um, so th there's there's more than one way to get that close. But uh, I I'm a huge fan of like even photographing ants. I don't know if anybody's tried, but it's hard. Uh, it's it's almost as hard as snowflakes, I'm sure, because uh, they don't stop moving. And uh, and I'm. I know yeah, you I'm, know. There's a really good trick with ants. Ants don't like chalk. You know, like you draw on a chalkboard with. So if you draw a circle around them in chalk, they won't cross over the chalk. It's a great way of keeping them out of your kitchen. If they're coming like through one area. You draw a line of chalk, and they don't like it. They won't. They won't walk over it. So they'll go and find another route. So you can actually yeah. track them. You have blown circle. my mind. Yeah, it works. <laughs> so it works, works with zombies. The little receptors on their antenna, and that's why they don't. It work. also works with honey instead of chalk. Just draw a little circle of honey around them. And they get stuck in it. Yeah, you can do the same thing with dead people, and they won't move either. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they do it at the scene of crime. Okay, good. No, yeah, it keeps just... the bodies in place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Brian. All right, so my, uh, my pick is uh, a friend of mine, and um, he's a Bay Area photographer. His name's Toby Harriman, and kind of like... Uh, Thomas's pick, you know, it's not that, that Toby was ever, I would consider him to be, uh, or, you know, like, that he started kind of lower, and he, but there's this, there's been, oh, and I just noticed he has a little watermark, which is such a faux pas. Um, uh, his stuff has been e exceptional. Um, he, he, you know, shooting the Golden Gate Bridge, um, but even just his long exposures and his, uh, Landscape stuff, very much an ethereal quality to them. Uh, like, I mean, this and uh, another person who is right up there is uh, Joe Azur, who uh, I wanted to go really quickly to. Uh, Joe, I call Joe kind of like the Golden Gate Whisperer. The the stuff that Joe shoots of uh, Golden Gate Bridge is, I mean, to me, it's second to none. I've never seen shots like his. Um, and I'm not good. just saying that because I'm trying to get a room in his apartment. 
but um, in all honesty, his stuff is just tremendous. So these are my two picks. Uh, also, kind of, I ended my my uh, gallery with an homage to Portland, and uh, I'm ending this with kind of like a see us soon Bay Area photographer. So that's that. All right, cool. Thanks. All right, okay. I know how we're gonna end the show because um, we have a, a comment here from Scotland from Stuart Forgy. He says that all we need to do to end the show is to get Kate to dance. Oh. <laughs> Stuart Forgy is one of my Forgy. Sorry, Stuart is one of my Kickstarter um, backers. One of my wonderful um, uh, Kickstarter backers for Mostly Harmless. And um, I did dance. I danced when I um, I, I made my um, Kickstarter total. Um, what I can do actually, I can do better than. Um, I can do better than actually dancing for you. I can show you that, and we can end on that. How about that? Because better than I'm dancing. Not, not going to dance for you. Uh, talk amongst yourselves while I scroll down and find it. What could be better than our girl Kate dancing? <laughs> yes. Dancing in a pub full of skeptics, having just... Here we are. Having just... Um, Having just cleared my Kickstarter total. By oh, 400%. every morning I get up and I clear my Kickstarter total. Mm. <laughs> Is that supposed to be an English accent? I don't know. I don't know what a clearing a Kickstarter total is, but that's all right. <laughs> so this is the last 20 seconds of my Kickstarter. And I was speaking in front of an audience of skepticals in a pub. Is skepticals British for like drunk Irish people? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. They basically were. I was talking about the internet and science. There's a there's a kind of like whole global movement of people who are rational thinkers and don't just believe everything that they're read. So, but this is me dancing. Oh, of course it froze. It froze. <laughs> I was hoping to see some some Elaine moves or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Some Seinfeldian. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> oh. Okay. That's all right. We'll send people to the website so they can check it out. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thanks. Um, thank, thank you for you having much. me. It's been a real pleasure. Okay, bye, Kate. Bye, Thomas. <laughs> bye, Dino. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you guys. Nice to meet you. Bye. See you, Don. Laters. Thanks, Trey. It was great fun.